Story 1 It was around 10 a.m. I was sitting at my desk in the office looking at a photograph I held in my hands. In it were a woman hugging a seven-year-old girl, my wife Sarah and daughter Emma, smiling happily and waving. I missed them terribly. It had been almost half a year since I saw them in person. Although we often call each other via video, deep down I longed for their warm, live embraces. I've been working as a ranger in a national park for ten years. My work begins with the first warm days of spring and continues until autumn when the park fills with visitors wanting to enjoy nature. Another season is now drawing to a close, just two more weeks, and I'll be able to return home. My thoughts were interrupted by a loud bang. I looked around. My partner was sitting next to me. He slammed his hand on the table, holding a smartphone in his hand and gesticulating furiously with the other. These damn fools they've lost again, you know, Jack? He turned to me. I really believed in them. Thought this time I'd make a killing. That damn coefficient was really good. Too good. Damn, I bet too much. He continued to shout angrily, cursing the entire team, the coach, and their ancestors. I decided to calm him down. Calm down, Bob. You know the bosses don't approve of betting. If they find out, you'll be in trouble. Oh, sorry. He looked around apprehensively and said quieter. Lately, I've only had losses and it's driving me crazy. Yesterday, we played poker at Old Dylan's. Imagine. Not a single damn set in the game. At most, two pairs in the evening. Damn what's happening. I shook my head disapprovingly, not endorsing my friend's hobby. He then pulled out a pack of snacks, opened them, and started eating, washing them down with coffee. I looked at him. His appearance had been not so great lately. Dark circles under his eyes, a protruding belly, and a double chin. But he still remained energetic. That's what he was loved for at work, for his restless and cheerful nature. John's daily feast, which had become almost a tradition, was interrupted by a knock. Patrick stood in the door. He looked disapprovingly at Bob, who was brushing snack crumbs off himself, and told us we were called for a meeting. Then he left. I got up, helping Bob clean up. Then we went to the conference room. When we entered, there were already a lot of people there, all gathered around the TV, listening intently. They were watching the news. A beautiful anchor with a worried face was delivering the latest events. Dear viewers, we are facing a significant challenge. A powerful cyclone is inexorably approaching our state. In this regard, local authorities have already announced the need for evacuation in a number of cities. According to the latest meteorological data, wind speed and precipitation intensity may reach critical values creating potentially dangerous conditions for residents of our communities. Citizens in the zone of the expected impact are strongly urged to follow the instructions of local authorities and refrain from travel unless it is directly related to the immediate evacuation. Please stay safe, keep up to date with updates, and do not neglect precautions. We will continue to inform you of developments as new information becomes available. Having listened to the announcer, our boss turned to us. You heard the news. This morning we got a call from the meteorological station warning of worsening weather and recommended closing the park. I've already ordered a closure notice to be put up, but there may still be people in the park. Your task is to patrol and warn visitors and ensure evacuation. Do you understand the task? We nodded in agreement and dispersed each employee responsible for their own section of the forest. Bob and I were responsible for the most remote. I began to get ready. We loaded the equipment into our pickup and set off. After driving about 20 miles, we stopped at a gravel parking lot. Beyond were the forest and hills. I looked at the sky. It was already beginning to cloud over. We had to walk two routes to save time and cover everything, so we decided to split up. We set off, and soon a fork appeared before us. I looked at my cell phone. It had no signal here. 
We had a radio, but it couldn't reach the base. A powerful radio was in the car, and in case of anything, getting to it was the first priority. After checking the connection, Bob and I went our separate ways. Walking along the winding trail in the hilly forest, I felt the wind becoming more persistent and colder. Tall trees around me bent under its pressure, creating a rustling of leaves that grew louder every minute. The sky was increasingly covered with dark clouds, heralding the approaching storm. Strangely, there were no tourists in the park today. Usually, there's always someone here, but apparently, the sense of bad weather scared them off. Only I was alone, my steps echoing in the silence of the forest. Suddenly, something unusual in the sky caught my attention. A plane, majestically and frighteningly, was falling to the ground. It was too low, and it seemed its wings flapped helplessly in the air. My heart froze with anxiety. The plane disappeared behind the nearest hill, and without a second thought I rushed there. On the way, I contacted Bob via the radio. Bob, old pal, can you hear me? Yes, Jack. Did you also see the falling plane? I saw it as it was descending. It must have crashed near your area. Yes, it's not far from me. I'm heading to the site. You go back to the truck and call for backup, by the way. Did you find any tourists? No, Jack. Not a single soul here, Bob replied. All right, then. Stay in touch, I said. Take care, buddy. As soon as I alert our guys, I'll head your way. I turned off the radio and continued on. About ten minutes later, I saw a column of smoke ahead. There was about a mile left to go. As I made my way through thick bushes, I heard a terrible scream in the distance. It seemed like someone was experiencing immense pain and was very frightened. I hastened and soon saw the trail of the plane crash. As it fell, it apparently hit and broke all the trees in its path making it likely that it had crashed harshly. I was right. Ahead on a small clearing lay the wrecked plane. It was a small turboprop aircraft with two engines and propellers. There was smoke coming from the engines, but no signs of fire. I sped up, ready to provide first aid. But as I approached the plane, a horrific sight unfolded before me. Beside it, where the rear side door was, lay two bodies. They were severely mutilated, but I could make out that they might have been Latinos. Wounds covered their entire bodies, one missing a chunk of flesh from his neck, as if bitten by some beast, the other had a similar wound on his thigh. I almost felt sick. Their faces were scarred with deep cuts, all indicating they died not from the plane crash, but from an attack by some creature. Realizing this, I looked around in fear. Whatever it was, it could still be nearby. But there was no one around. Only the strong wind blew, bending the trees. I drew my pistol and continued the inspection. Carefully walking past the bodies, I looked into the cabin. There I found large wooden crates scattered around the cabin. One was overturned, its lid broken, and packets of white powder had spilled out one torn open and the powder spread across the floor. The plane was possibly transporting drugs, I thought, and continued searching. In the tail, I found a large broken cage, its bars bent as if someone had forcefully broken out. Apparently, during the flight, some creature had escaped from it and attacked the crew. I went into the pilot's cabin, where a man lay in one of the seats, a tree trunk protruding from his chest, having pierced the windshield. Was there anyone else alive? I exited the plane and contacted Bob on the radio, telling him what had happened. He was very surprised, asking me in detail about the incident. After the conversation, I continued searching. I noticed two sets of footprints leading away from the plane and animal tracks all around. I decided to follow them and set off. As I walked through the forest, the daylight gradually faded. Twilight covered the woods, 
and every shadow now seemed deeper, more mysterious. The wind picked up, driving ahead of it the harbingers of the storm, dark, looming clouds. I turned on my flashlight and bent lower, afraid of losing the tracks. I felt every gust of wind that blew through my clothes and made the trees around me rustle and creak. Each step on the soft forest ground seemed louder than usual, and my heart beat so loudly I could hear it in my ears. I kept looking over my shoulder but only saw dense thickets and flickering shadows between the trees. I wonder if Bob had called for backup. Judging by the time, they should be arriving soon. I quickly grabbed the radio to contact him, feeling growing anxiety. Pressing the call button, I expected to hear his voice, but only static noise responded. Hey, can you hear me? I tried again, but the radio only buzzed back, bringing neither response nor comfort. My heart beat faster with worry. What happened? Why isn't he answering? Thoughts raced through my mind. Pressing the button again, I tried to call him, but all my attempts were drowned in the silent noise of the radio. Suddenly, I felt that I was being watched. It wasn't just a premonition. I instinctively felt someone's presence. My eyes strained to see in the darkness, but they couldn't make out anything. Anxiety hung in the air, intensified by the wind's noise and the distant rumble of thunder. I quickened my pace, trying not to lose sight of the tracks on the ground. The forest became darker, and I felt raindrops begin to fall on my face. Every rustle made me flinch. My thoughts revolved around one thing. Who's there? Friend or foe? I pondered whether I should turn back, but then thought those people might need help. Yes, they were smugglers, but still humans. My duty dictated that I should continue the search. Soon the sky closed in, and it began to rain. Hastily, I pulled a raincoat from my backpack and put it on, trying to shield myself from the pouring rain as quickly as possible. Raindrops drummed on the fabric, adding a background noise to the already resonant forest. The ground under my feet became soft and wet. My boots heavily sunk into the moist earth with each step, as if sinking into thick mud. I tried to move faster, but the wet soil resisted, slowing my steps. The tracks on the ground began to fade, becoming less noticeable under the rain streams. The bad weather engulfing the forest was taking its toll. I realized I needed to hurry if I wanted to find them. And then, amidst the roar of the wind and the sound of falling water, I heard a scream. It came from afar but was clear enough to direct me. I ran towards the sound, overcoming the resistance of the mud and obstructing branches. My heart pounded in unison with my rapid steps. All my senses were heightened. I felt every raindrop, every gust of wind on my face. Instinctively, I drew my pistol from its holster, holding it ready. Not knowing what to expect, I continued running towards the source of the scream. Thoughts of what might have happened and the potential danger that could lie ahead flashed through my mind. Approaching closer, I saw a Latino man standing in the middle of the forest, in a state of fear. He looked around as if fearing something invisible and threatening. Surveying the surroundings, I found nothing unusual, except for the two of us. As I got closer, his face lit up with joy. He rushed towards me, repeating the word, help. As soon as he got near, the man immediately hid behind me, still looking around. Terror was evident in his eyes, and he kept repeating the words, hombre lobo. These words, spoken with such fear, made me tense up. What could have scared this man so much? What had he seen in those woods? Just as I heard rustling in the bushes, the Latino man beside me started to emit piercing screams, throwing out unintelligible words in Spanish. I tried to calm him down, while firmly holding my pistol, ready for any turn of events. The rain intensified, 
making visibility increasingly difficult. The noise in the bushes shifted left, then right. It seemed as though something was moving around us at incredible speed. I tried to follow every rustle, turning in different directions, but the location of the creature was impossible to accurately determine. My heart pounded with fear and excitement. Then it happened. The creature, with inhuman speed, burst out of the bushes right at us. It all happened so quickly that I didn't even have time to react. I saw only a humanoid silhouette. With a sudden blow, it grabbed the man and carried him off into the depths of the forest. I was left standing alone, paralyzed by shock and disbelief at what had just occurred. The silence was suddenly broken by a long, piercing howl emanating from the bushes. This sound made my blood run cold. I realized I had encountered something whose nature and power surpassed anything I had faced before. My mind raced with thousands of thoughts about what to do next. Part of me wanted to run away, but I couldn't ignore the source of that terrifying howl. Gathering my courage, I slowly headed towards the bushes from where the sound had come. But as soon as I approached, something powerful struck me in the chest. The blow was so strong it knocked the wind out of me. I fell on my back, feeling the cold raindrops beating against my face. I tried to grab my pistol, but in vain. The weapon had been knocked out of my hands and rolled away. I tried to gather my strength when suddenly it appeared above me. The creature was hard to describe in words. Its body was covered in thick fur, and its face was a horrifying mix of human, ape, and wolf features, with something reminiscent of a bat. Its eyes glowed with an incredible yellow light, full of rage and madness, and blood dripped from its mouth. Lying there, under the gaze of this monster, I felt that my end was near. Everything seemed so unreal, but the fear I experienced was absolutely real. Suddenly, a loud gunshot sounded from the side. Someone had fired a flare, brightly illuminating the sky. Its light reflected off the wet leaves and raindrops. The creature, which had just threatened to tear me apart, started and began nervously looking around. It seemed as surprised as I was. With incredible speed, it retreated, disappearing into the dense forest. I tried to get up, but my body refused to obey. I felt every gust of wind whipping my face, mixing with the cold raindrops. Suddenly, a man leaned over me. He extended his hand, and grabbing it, I somehow managed to get on my feet. How are you feeling? he asked me, his voice urgent and concerned. I looked around, picked up my flashlight and pistol, which had fallen nearby. Under the flashlight's beam, I could finally see his face. He was about 45 years old, a blonde, tall man. He wore glasses, which he was now wiping from the raindrops streaming down the lenses. My name is David Miller, he introduced himself. I asked what he was doing in the forest, but in response David just shrugged ambiguously evading a direct answer. This seemed suspicious to me, but at the moment my main priority was to get out of here. I tried to contact Bob through the radio again, but all I heard in response was silence. I tried to recall where I had come from and headed in that direction, but suddenly my path was blocked. We were surrounded. Numerous powerful flashlights blindingly shone in my face and Kalashnikov rifles were pointed at me. My heart froze with fear. Drop the weapon! Someone shouted loudly from the darkness. I saw no other option and complied. One of the men approached me closer, and before I could understand anything, I felt a sharp pain in my head from a butt stroke. Everything around became blurred and I lost consciousness, falling into the wet, cold ground of the forest. When I came to, the first thing I felt was the tight ropes binding my hands. Darkness enveloped everything around, and it took me a few moments to adapt to the gloom. Looking around, I realized I was in a tent. 
the air was stuffy and smelled of smoke. Mr. Miller was sitting next to me, his hands also tied. From his look, I understood that he had already come to his senses and was assessing the situation. Outside the tent, I heard the crackle of a fire, and through the thin fabric, I felt the raindrops continuously beating on its surface. I tried to talk to Miller to understand what was going on and what our chances were of getting out of here. But before I could utter a word, voices carried over the noise of the rain and the crackling fire. They spoke in Spanish and seemed to be having a lively conversation. It became clear to me that we were not alone in this forest and that we were being held by no ordinary people. I asked what was happening. Mr. Miller sighed, his face looking tired and worried in the dim light penetrating the tent. We are captured, he began slowly. We've fallen into a trap set by smugglers. It seems they think we might interfere with their operation or know too much. They might execute us. After his words, I wondered how he knew so much. I pointed this out to him, to which he said, All right, I'll tell my story, Miller began. His voice was calm, but I sensed a note of fatigue. It happened a couple of years ago. I was working as a botany professor at the University of California, Berkeley. My specialization was tropical plants. As part of a research project, I often visited various parts of Latin America. During that period, while I was in Oaxaca, Mexico, I happened to wander into a secluded village, deep hidden in the jungles. It was a place where civilization had not yet penetrated. The tribe living there turned out to be surprisingly friendly. They warmly welcomed me, allowing me to study the local flora and immerse myself in their unique culture. What intrigued me most were their beliefs and rituals. One day they took me to an ancient temple, hidden in the heart of the jungle. It was a truly impressive sight. The temple reminded me of the majestic structures of the Incas. The walls were decorated with ancient paintings and drawings, telling the myths and legends of the tribe. But the most astonishing was the depiction of their main deity, a creature with the body of a man and the head of a wolf. This image was repeated in different parts of the temple, hinting at its central importance in their culture. Miller paused. A reflective gleam appeared in his eyes, as if he was transported back to that distant and mysterious moment in his life. This deity, Miller continued, his voice growing softer, was truly frightening. The tribe called it Tecolotl, which in their language meant Night Hunter. According to their beliefs, it was a creature with mighty powers, capable of taking the form of both a human and a wolf. According to the legend, Tecolotl was both a protector and avenger. On full moon nights, it supposedly emerged from its temple to guard the village from evil spirits and enemies. But its protection had a price. It was said to demand sacrifices, and if not satisfied, the werewolf could turn into a ruthless killer. The temple walls depicted it in various scenes, standing on two legs, surrounded by a circle of fire, and on all fours, lunging at its prey. Its eyes were always depicted shining yellow, and its teeth were sharp and bloody. Day by day I delved into the study of the frescoes in the temple, striving to decipher each symbol, each image associated with Tecolotl. My fascination did not go unnoticed, and one day the tribal chief noticed my interest. He approached me and said he wanted to show me this god. I was stunned. Did they really believe he was real? I thought. But the chief seemed absolutely serious and confident in his words. He led me to the outskirts of the village where the priestess lived. I had never been to that part of the village before, as I had always been forbidden to enter there. This place was shrouded in mystery and reverence. The priestess's dwelling was separated from the rest of the village, surrounded by various talismans and symbols. 
The air was filled with a sense of something ancient and mystical. When we entered, the priestess sat in the center of the room, surrounded by strange artifacts and religious symbols. Wisdom and knowledge of secrets inaccessible to mere mortals were evident in her eyes. The chief explained my interest in Tecolotl to her, and she nodded as if understanding something significant. She led me through the village, and soon we arrived at the entrance to a small stone-built temple. Climbing up the stone staircase, I found myself in a kind of arena covered with sand. In the center of this arena, I saw a creature that at first glance seemed to have sprung from the darkest of my nightmares. I instinctively wiped my glasses, not believing my eyes. Before me was a creature, hunched over and gnawing on a goat's skull. Its appearance was terrifying and yet mesmerizing. It was covered in fur and had the head of a wolf, but the body of a human or even an ape. When it noticed us, its movements slowed down and it slowly turned its head towards us. For a moment I thought I saw a flicker of joy in its eyes at the sight of the priestess. The creature pricked up its ears and grinned in a smile that was nonetheless terrifying. I stood motionless, trying to comprehend how this was possible. The priestess slowly and dignifiedly descended into the arena, and then something astonishing happened. The creature, which had just seemed so threatening and fearsome, ran up to her and began to nuzzle her, like a huge but obedient pet. I watched this scene in complete bewilderment, my gaze shifting to the chief. Noticing my astonishment, he explained, She is his mother, and he is her son. I couldn't believe my ears, and asked him again if she had really given birth to this creature. My knowledge of biology and genetics screamed at the impossibility of such a phenomenon. No mutations could transform a human being into what I saw before me. But the chief nodded, confirming his words. I felt reality, as I had always believed in it, beginning to blur. This was a moment where myths and legends clashed with the scientific understanding of the world. But in front of my eyes was undeniable evidence of something incomprehensible, something I could not explain with any scientific theory. Days passed, and I spent each one observing this amazing creature. I began to feed it, trying to establish contact. At first it was wild and unpredictable, but gradually it seemed to start getting used to me. Its behavior was reminiscent of a wolf, cautious and vigilant, yet curious. Over time, it began to allow me closer. I cautiously approached it, spoke to it in a soft, soothing voice, sometimes even trying to stroke its fur. At some moments, I felt like a unique bond was being established between us. But despite these moments of seeming trust, I never forgot that I was facing a real wild beast. Its eyes always harbored unpredictability, and its movements remained quick and sharp. I understood that at any moment its instincts could take over, and it could behave completely unpredictably. This continued until a tragedy occurred. The priestess died, falling from a cliff. After her tragic death, a dark time descended upon the village. She was not just a spiritual leader, but, as I realized, a link between the village and the creature they considered their god, Tecolotl. Her loss shocked everyone, but it most profoundly affected Tecolotl's behavior. He became much more aggressive and unpredictable, began to howl and growl more frequently. One day, when a local came to feed Tecolotl, the creature attacked and mauled him. This became a turning point in the village's attitude towards the creature. They decided it was a sign that their god demanded sacrifices. They began sending people to it. Day by day, the creature killed them. I could no longer stay silent, witnessing the deaths of innocent people. I liked these people, their culture, and way of life. 
I couldn't accept what was happening. I tried to talk to the chief, trying to convince him it was wrong, that there must be another way to appease Tecolotl. But my words found no resonance. In their eyes, I was an outsider who didn't understand their traditions and beliefs. I decided to steal him. I knew this decision would change my life forever, Miller continued. I used my knowledge of drugs to sedate the creature. Local bandits whom I hired helped me with this. I don't know what the village's reaction was after our disappearance, but we quickly and silently transported the creature to a hidden airstrip. My goal was to take it to the U.S. for further study. I understood that it couldn't be done legally, so I had to resort to the services of local smugglers. Perhaps that was my biggest mistake. When we were loading the creature onto the plane, it suddenly woke up. But to my surprise, it behaved calmly, as if it understood what was happening. Four other people were on board with me. They were dealing with their cargo. We took off, and I thought everything was going according to plan. We had already crossed the border, and everything seemed calm until one of the smugglers decided to have some fun. I don't know why he wasn't afraid of Tecolotl. He took out a packet of cocaine and offered it to the creature. I tried to stop him, but another smuggler, laughing, pointed his gun at me. When Tecolotl swallowed the drug, something in him changed. He seemed to grow in size. His eyes lit up like lanterns, and he let out a powerful roar. Then the smugglers really got scared. One of them shot, but the creature was unfazed. It forcefully bent the cage and broke out. Panic and a fight for survival ensued. The pilot, seeing what was happening, decided to make a landing. He preferred to risk crashing rather than become Tecolotl's prey. I hid behind boxes, hoping I wouldn't be noticed, and it seemed I was lucky. Soon the plane crash-landed. One pilot died, the other jumped out and ran away. Tecolotl, breaking out the twisted door, dragged out the bodies and began devouring them, biting off pieces from each, then disappeared into the forest. I followed the fleeing pilot. That's when I met you. I used a flare gun that scared off the beast, but unfortunately, attracted the attention of drug traffickers. And here I am, tied up in this tent, telling you all this. Listening to this incredible story, I felt a mixture of disbelief and amazement. It sounded like a plot from a horror movie, not a real-life story. But the worry in Miller's eyes told me he was speaking the truth. Nevertheless, what troubled me most was that I hadn't noticed the presence of a drug trafficker's base in my park. How could they have hidden so skillfully? It raised many questions about the security and reliability of my work in the park. I pondered this, realizing that despite the terrifying power of the creature, people could be far more dangerous. The drug traffickers now holding us captive were unpredictable and cruel and what they would decide to do with us next was utterly unclear. This thought made me feel even more helpless and anxious. We sat in the cramped tent, listening to the wind and rain noise when suddenly there was a commotion outside. Sounds of an argument, voices raised in shouting. One of the bandits suddenly pulled back the tent fabric and led us outside. The cold wind and downpour hit us with renewed force, feeling like being in the middle of a sea storm. Wet clothes clung to my body and the wind made me shiver. We were led to a wooden shelter where a fire burned, around which a group of people sat. The firelight flickered on their faces, casting long shadows. I felt like I was in another world, among strangers, in an incomprehensible situation, under the scrutinizing gaze of people who could decide our fate. When thunder boomed, it shook me to the core. But the real shock for me wasn't from the lightning, but from what I saw before me. Among the group of arguing people, I recognized a familiar face. It was Bob, my partner, the man I knew better than anyone. Thoughts raced through my head, 
connecting in a chain of events that until this moment had seemed incomprehensible to me. Now I understood why Bob hadn't responded to my radio calls after my message about the drugs on the plane. Now I understood how drug traffickers had been able to hide so successfully in my park. But one question nagged at me. Why had Bob done this? Why had he got involved with these people? The answer seemed simple. Perhaps he had lost a large sum of money, and this was his way out of the situation. But this knowledge only deepened my sadness and disappointment. I couldn't believe that my longtime colleague and friend had been drawn into such a dark story. When we were brought to Bob and the gang leader, I saw Bob shamefully look at me. He lowered his head and quietly said, Sorry, old pal. I did all I could. I found no words in response. A storm of disappointment and betrayal raged inside me. I didn't plead with him to intervene on my behalf. A feeling of profound disappointment spread within me, deeply shaking my faith in people. The gang leader, seizing the moment when everyone around was absorbed in the argument and noise, pulled out a pistol and pointed it at us. Bob turned away, unable to meet my eyes. At that moment, I thought of my family, how in a couple of weeks I was supposed to meet them. These thoughts of protection and love for my family filled me, leaving little room for fear or anger. Standing in front of the pistol barrel, I realized how suddenly and cruelly someone's dreams and hopes could be cut short. The life I knew and loved and the people dear to me could disappear in an instant because of others' decisions and mistakes. It was a bitter realization, but at the same time, it gave me the strength to face danger with dignity. When the leader unexpectedly turned the gun barrel towards Miller, the latter simply closed his eyes, resignedly awaiting his fate. A gunshot rang out, and Miller fell lifelessly to the ground. I couldn't hold back and shouted, You bastard! At that very moment, a furious howl echoed in the air, almost simultaneously with my cry. The bandits, gripped by panic, started shouting, Hombre Lobo, while their leader anxiously looked around. Suddenly, something with incredible speed burst under the shelter, ruthlessly crushing everything in its path. It moved so fast that people couldn't react in time. There were cries and gunshots all around. I seized the moment of chaos, darted to the side and ducked. Under the shelter, pure chaos erupted. People in panic were screaming. The air was filled with the smell of blood and gunshots were ringing out everywhere. The creature, like a deadly shadow vortex, continued its merciless killing spree. I lay on the ground, trying to remain unnoticed, while madness reigned around me. In the darkness, illuminated only by the flickers from the campfire and flashes of gunshots, the scene appeared apocalyptic. I realized that my life hung by a thread, and with each passing second, the chances of survival grew slimmer. Suddenly, a lifeless body fell beside me. It was Bob. He looked at me with a plea in his eyes, blood pouring from his chest, creating a dark stain on the ground. It was friendly fire. In the panic and chaos, the bandits had started shooting at each other. I crawled towards Bob, trying to understand what he wanted to tell me. He whispered hoarsely, his words barely reaching my ears. I leaned closer to his face, and with his last strength, he grabbed my shirt and whispered, Run, Jack. After those words, he went limp, and his hand slackened. I called his name, shook him, but Bob no longer responded. At that moment, the realization hit me that my friend, with whom I had spent so many years together, faced numerous trials, and who, despite the betrayal, remained a part of my life, was gone forever. Tears welled up involuntarily in my eyes. All the noise and chaos around seemed to recede, leaving me alone with my grief and loss. I sat next to his body, 
lost in my thoughts. When suddenly, I realized that I needed to act. Bob's words, run Jack, echoed in my mind as a call to action. I got up, quickly surveyed my surroundings, and searched for a way to escape amidst the madness and chaos. Deep down, I knew I had to get out of there alive, so that all these sacrifices and losses wouldn't be in vain. Gradually regaining my senses, I headed westward. Soon, I stumbled upon a familiar trail and followed it until I reached the place where my car was parked. To my surprise, my colleagues were already waiting for me there. It turned out that when I stopped communicating, a search party was sent after me. Seeing me in an exhausted and battered state, they immediately rushed me to the hospital. On the way, I recounted everything that had happened. The incident became known to the police and other authorities, and my words found confirmation in their investigations. Later, I came to say goodbye to the park before leaving for my city. Standing at the forest edge, I suddenly heard a howl. It came from a distance deep within the woods. I swear it sounded like the howl of a werewolf. Perhaps it was a new inhabitant of these parts. This sound reminded me of all the mysteries and secrets that nature holds, and that the world is full of unexplored and frightening phenomena. Story 2 as the relentless sun scorched the vast, seemingly boundless Syrian desert, I, Captain John Hawkins, stood steadfastly by the colossal MTT truck. My gaze was fixed on the meticulous loading of vital communication equipment. The air was filled with the gruff shouts of the loaders, a cacophony that underscored the significance of our task. Each crate, especially the large one that was the centerpiece of our cargo, was handled with a reverence that bordered on the religious. This crate, sealed tightly and peppered with mysterious holes, piqued my curiosity, but protocol and the stern looks from the overseeing government officials kept my questions at bay. Among these officials, several individuals in nondescript civilian attire stood out. They kept their eyes hawk-like on the cargo, particularly the enigmatic large crate suggesting its contents were of extraordinary value. Our mission was deceptively simple yet of paramount importance. Transport this cargo from the ancient storied city of Palmyra to Deir Ez Zor. A journey that, under normal circumstances, would take about six, eight hours along the M20 highway. However, these were not normal circumstances. The route cut straight through the heart of the Syrian desert, a land infamous for its unforgiving heat, sudden and blinding sandstorms, and the ever-present threat of ambushes by local bandits. It was a land that tested the mettle of even the most seasoned travelers. Thus, our squad of ten, bolstered by the presence of five government officials, was tasked with ensuring the safe passage of this mysterious cargo. Our preparations had been thorough, each member of the team was a seasoned veteran, handpicked for their expertise and experience in such high-risk operations. The air was thick with tension, a silent acknowledgement of the dangers that lay ahead. The final piece of equipment was secured with a resounding click, signaling the end of our preparations and the beginning of our perilous journey. I made my way to my designated vehicle, the heart of our convoy. The truck was an imposing beast, its engine rumbling like distant thunder. Inside, I was joined by Lieutenant Smith, a man of few words but unshakable composure, and Mr. Jefferson, a tall, enigmatic figure from the government whose age seemed hard to place. He carried himself with an air of authority that demanded respect. Our convoy was a formidable sight. Leading and trailing were two heavily armored MRAPs, their mounted machine guns casting ominous shadows. Our truck, carrying the precious cargo, was sandwiched securely in the middle. Flanking us were a couple of sleek SUVs, their tinted windows hiding the government officials who were as much a mystery as the cargo we were transporting. 
The journey began with the slow, lumbering movement of our convoy out of the private courtyard where the loading had taken place. We passed an old Arab stone house, its architecture a testament to the region's rich history. Its high, narrow windows overlooked an inner courtyard where a once vibrant fountain now lay silent, a mute witness to the passage of time and the stories it carried. The local children, their faces a mixture of curiosity and awe, clustered along the road. Their excited chatter and pointing fingers a brief, heartening distraction from the weight of our mission. As we left the confines of civilization, the terrain shifted. The road became a mere dirt track, a precursor to the vast open desert that lay ahead. The landscape around us was a tapestry of extremes, endless dunes that rose and fell like the waves of a petrified ocean, their golden hues ever changing with the sun's position. Here and there, hardy shrubs clung to life their existence a defiant stand against the harsh, arid climate. The air was thick and hot, a tangible presence that seemed to press against us with an almost physical weight. The sky was a relentless expanse of blue, unmarred by clouds, its vastness a reminder of our insignificance in the face of nature's grandeur. The silence of the desert was overwhelming a stark contrast to the noise and chaos of the loading area. It was a silence that spoke volumes, filled with the whispers of ancient sands and the secrets they held. In this desolate expanse, the sun was a merciless overseer, its rays beating down upon us with an intensity that seemed to penetrate to the very core. The heat was more than just a physical sensation. It was an ever-present force, an adversary we had to contend with every moment. The shimmering heat haze on the horizon danced and distorted the landscape, creating mirages that toyed with our senses. Our convoy trudged along, a metallic beast crawling through the ancient sands. Inside the truck, the hum of the engine and the occasional crackle of the radio were the only sounds that pierced the overwhelming silence. The atmosphere was one of solemn anticipation, each of us lost in our own thoughts, mentally preparing for the journey ahead. I glanced at Mr. Jefferson, who sat stoically, his eyes fixed on the horizon. His demeanor was an enigma, calm yet unreadable, adding another layer of mystery to our mission. Lieutenant Smith, ever the professional, kept his focus on the road, his hands steady on the wheel despite the rough terrain. As we approached the M20 highway, the landscape began to change subtly. The endless dunes gave way to flatter, more navigable terrain. Though the oppressive heat and the blinding brightness of the sun remained constant companions. The highway itself, a lifeline cutting through the desert, stretched out before us, a ribbon of tarmac that represented both our path forward and the challenges that lay ahead. I broke the silence, my voice sounding strangely loud in the confines of the truck. Mr. Jefferson, this cargo we're transporting. Can you tell us anything about it? I asked, my curiosity getting the better of me. He turned his gaze to me, his eyes revealing nothing. It's just equipment, Captain. Nothing for you to worry about, he replied, his voice even and unemotional. I nodded, though his response did little to quell my curiosity. Beside me, Lieutenant Smith opened his mouth as if to speak, then seemed to think better of it. He turned his attention back to the road, a silent acknowledgement that some questions were better left unasked. As we merged onto the highway, our speed increased, the convoy settling into a steady rhythm. The landscape blurred past us, a monotonous blend of sand and sky. As the relentless sun bore down upon us, our convoy, a line of dust-covered vehicles, wound its way through the Syrian desert. The silence inside the truck was as dense as the heat outside. 
Only the steady hum of the engine and the occasional crackle of the radio broke the monotonous drone. I sat deep in thought, my gaze occasionally drifting to the barren, sun-bleached landscape that stretched endlessly on either side of the highway. A fleeting glimpse of a desert fox, a rare sight in these arid lands, momentarily captured our attention as it darted across the road. Its russet fur was a stark contrast against the pale sands, a fleeting moment of life in an otherwise lifeless expanse. It was in this moment that Mr. Jefferson chose to speak. Captain, how long have you served in Syria? He asked, his voice smooth yet carrying an undercurrent of curiosity. Nearly a year, sir, I replied, maintaining a professional demeanor. He nodded thoughtfully before delving into a topic seemingly unrelated to our current task. You must have had extensive contact with the locals, have you ever heard about the wild asses that once roamed here? He inquired. His question caught me off guard. No, sir, I haven't. My focus has been elsewhere, I responded, slightly puzzled by the sudden shift in conversation. Clearly, the Syrian wild ass, Equus hemionus hemippus, a subspecies of the wild ass once inhabited the Middle East. Smaller and more resilient than its counterparts, adapted to the arid desert conditions, it struggled to survive. Yet, despite its efforts, it became extinct, succumbed to hunting and habitat loss. Humans are cold and merciless, and in the war against them one must either hide from them or adapt to become useful, to not interfere. This is the path to survival. The Arabs have a legend. In the endless deserts of the Middle East, caravans whispered legends of a ghoul named Zahira. She was a night creature, a twisted echo of her former human self. Zahira lived in the ruins of ancient cities, luring unsuspecting travelers with the guise of a young, seductive woman. Those who succumbed to her charms ended up in her lair, never to return. It is said Zahira was once a princess who fell victim to a curse for her pride and cruelty. Transformed into a ghoul, she roamed battlefields and graveyards, feeding on the dead. She could transform into various forms, often appearing as a hyena or reverting to human form to deceive her prey. The only way to defeat Zahira was with a single decisive weapon strike. A second strike would revive her. I listened, intrigued yet wary. An interesting story, I finally said, trying to gauge his intention behind sharing such a tale. Mr. Jefferson's response was a thin smile. Imagine if the wild asses had adapted like Zahira. Would they have met the same fate? Adaptation, Captain, is the key to survival. And perhaps it's not just the domain of rats and cockroaches, he mused his smile widening just a fraction. The conversation dwindled, leaving me to ponder his words. I reflexively checked my pistol, a habit ingrained from years of service. His talk of mythical creatures and the parallels he drew with our mission left me unsettled. I felt a sudden dryness in my throat and reached for my water flask, unscrewing the cap and taking a long sip. But then, a sound from behind, a distinct thud, made me choke on the water, coughing as I hastily turned around. My eyes darted to the rearview mirror, but all I saw was the dusty road and the convoy trailing us. Did you hear that? I asked, my voice laced with concern. Lieutenant Smith, our driver, gave a brief nod, his expression tense. Mr. Jefferson, however, remained calm almost unnervingly so. After a brief silence, he simply said, pay it no mind. His nonchalance did little to ease my growing sense of unease. What were we carrying in this convoy that warranted such secrecy and protection? Before I could probe further, the unexpected happened. The vehicle ahead came to a sudden grinding halt, sending a jolt through our truck as we braked hard. 
Without hesitation, I grabbed my rifle and exited the truck. My eyes scanned the surroundings, the stark, unyielding desert offering no clues. The heat was a palpable force, waves of it distorting the air and blending the horizon into a mirage. The road, once a symbol of connection and progress, now resembled a war-torn landscape, riddled with deep craters and littered with debris. Massive chunks of asphalt lay scattered like the remnants of some forgotten battle, a stark reminder of the conflict that had ravaged this land. My eyes surveyed the destruction, a knot of apprehension tightening in my gut. Lieutenant Harris, leading the convoy in the first vehicle, approached me with a grave expression that mirrored my concern. Captain, this route is impassable, he stated pointing to the ravaged highway. Our best option is to detour through the desert and loop back to the road further on. His voice carried the weight of experience, one honed in the crucible of countless missions. The desert, though seemingly empty, was fraught with hidden dangers. Mines could be buried beneath the innocent-looking sands, and the occasional scrubby bushes provided ideal cover for insurgents. I scanned the horizon, the vast expanse of sand stretching out in every direction, feeling the weight of the decision upon me. It was then that Meister Jefferson, the enigmatic government official who had been a constant presence of mystery, joined our discussion. His gaze lingered on the devastated road before us. We need to move quickly, Captain, he said, his voice laced with urgency. We don't have the luxury of time. Take the detour. His words brooked no argument, and I could sense an underlying importance in his tone that went beyond our immediate predicament. Reluctantly, I issued the order. A scout vehicle moved ahead, cautiously navigating the treacherous off-road terrain while we maintained a safe distance. The journey was jarring. The vehicle shook violently as it traversed the uneven desert. Amidst the tumultuous ride, the mysterious thumping from the cargo area returned, more insistent than before. I cast a questioning glance at Mr. Jefferson, frustration edging my voice. What in God's name are we carrying? His response was curt, delivered with a commanding authority that brooked no further inquiry. Ignore it, Captain. That's an order. His words echoed in my mind as we continued our journey. The soldiers around me shared looks of unease, each man battling his own thoughts and fears. Eventually, we navigated the rough terrain and rejoined the highway. The soldiers' tension was palpable, eyes constantly roving, hands gripping their weapons a little tighter. The gunner swiveled ceaselessly, vigilant against any potential threat. Despite the ever-present danger, we encountered no further obstacles and accelerated along the highway. The road ahead stretched into the distance, flanked by small cliffs and mountains that heralded a more dangerous terrain. The looming canyons were notorious for their treacherous turns and hidden crevices, perfect for ambushes. As we entered a narrow canyon, the towering rock walls closed in around us, their imposing presence casting long, dark shadows across our path. The canyon was a stark, rugged beauty its walls a tapestry of reds, oranges, and browns, carved by the relentless forces of nature over millennia. The narrow path wound its way through the towering cliffs, the silence of the desert amplified by the enclosing rocks. Here, in this ancient corridor carved by wind and time, we were acutely aware of our vulnerability. Small shrubs and hardy plants clung to life in the crevices, their stubborn existence a testament to the harshness of this environment. We proceeded with heightened caution, the convoy tightly knit as we navigated the serpentine path. My eyes darted from shadow to shadow, searching for any sign of movement, any hint of danger. The soldiers were tense, their training and instincts on high alert, the atmosphere was charged, each of us braced for the unseen and the unexpected. 
It was about five minutes into the canyon when my gaze fell upon something unsettling. A kufiya, its red and white fabric barely visible against the rocky backdrop. A surge of adrenaline shot through me as I grasped the full implication of what I was seeing. Danger was imminent. I reached for the radio to alert the others, but my actions were too slow. From behind a large boulder, a figure appeared, brandishing a rocket launcher, the unmistakable silhouette of a Soviet-made IGLA anti-tank system. Time seemed to slow as I watched him launch the missile, its trail zigzagging through the air towards us. I yelled a warning, but it was lost in the cacophony of the ensuing explosion. The world erupted in chaos. The force of the blast sent shockwaves through the convoy, and our vehicle, caught in the maelstrom, was violently tossed. I could hear the screeching of metal, the shattering of glass, and the shouts of my men, all melding into a symphony of destruction. The impact was like a hammer blow, throwing me against the interior of the truck. My head spun, and my vision blurred, the line between consciousness and darkness wavering precariously. As consciousness slowly seeped back into my mind, I found myself being dragged across the rugged terrain of the Syrian desert. The ground beneath me was a patchwork of coarse sand and sharp rocks, scraping against my skin with every jolt. My ears rang with the cacophony of gunfire and desperate shouts, a stark contrast to the eerie silence that had preceded the ambush. When my vision finally cleared, I saw my squad members in defensive positions, their faces etched with determination and fear. They were firing towards distant shadows, figures obscured by the haze of the desert heat. We were on a slight incline, a vantage point about a mile away from the smoldering remains of our convoy. The scene was one of utter devastation. The air was thick with the acrid smell of burning metal and rubber. Scattered around the wreckage were our assailants, easily distinguishable in their eclectic mix of traditional Arabic clothing and military gear. It was apparent that we had been overwhelmed by their numbers, forcing us to retreat to this precarious position. They were systematically firing in our direction while simultaneously scavenging through the remnants of our cargo. Amongst the chaos, I noticed several of them attempting to force open the largest crate, the primary focus of our mission. With effort, I managed to get to my feet and grabbed my rifle, joining my squad in the firefight. I took aim at the figures surrounding the crate, my heart pounding as I squeezed the trigger. I managed to hit one, watching as his comrades hastily dragged him to cover, but they did not cease their efforts to open the crate. Mr. Jefferson, who until now had been an enigmatic presence, was actively firing beside me. Amidst the chaos, he yelled out, emphasizing the importance of preventing the crate from being opened. We concentrated our firepower, but our efforts were in vain. The assailants had managed to pry the crate half open, and what followed seemed like a nightmare come to life. The crate's door suddenly burst outward from the inside, hitting one of the attackers with such force that he was thrown several feet into the air. From within, a creature emerged. It was massive, resembling a grotesquely mutated dog, its movements a blur of deadly precision. It tore through the attackers with a ferocious rage that was chilling to witness. The beast's killing spree was brutal and swift. It lunged at one man, biting off his limb in a spray of blood. Another assailant was disemboweled within seconds, his inside spilling onto the desert sand. The air was filled with the sickening sounds of flesh being torn and bones being crushed. As the creature wreaked havoc, the attacker's focus shifted from us to the new threat. Their screams of terror mingled with the sound of gunfire as they desperately tried to fend off the beast. The scene before us was one of pure carnage the ground quickly turning into a gruesome tableau soaked in blood. In the midst of this horror, panic set in among the bandits, and they began to flee. The creature pursued them relentlessly, its fury unrelenting. 
Mr. Jefferson's voice cut through our shock, urging us to move. I nodded, snapping out of my dazed state, and quickly assessed our situation. A roll call revealed the heart-wrenching cost of the ambush. Corporal Smith, always the one to lighten the mood, and Senior Lieutenant Avertly, the embodiment of stoicism, were both gone. Their absence created a void that was felt deeply by every member of our squad. Additionally, one of the government officials had been killed. Our numbers were now reduced to eight, including two wounded and four remaining government agents. I radioed for backup, receiving confirmation that help would arrive in six hours. Our immediate priority was to distance ourselves from the chaos and the unknown horror we had unleashed. The only remaining vehicle, an MRAP, had been rendered inoperable during our retreat. We salvaged what we could, stretchers for the wounded, essential equipment, ammunition, and most importantly, water. In the unforgiving desert, water was as valuable as life itself. The realization that we needed to evacuate immediately was unanimous. The creature, a living embodiment of terror, posed a threat we were ill-equipped to handle. It was a force of nature, unpredictable and deadly. As we prepared to leave, the gravity of our situation weighed heavily on us. The burning vehicles behind us were a grim reminder of the day's events, a testament to the chaos we had narrowly escaped. Yet, there was no time for mourning or reflection. Survival was our only objective. I activated the GPS beacon to ensure that rescuers could locate us. With the wounded securely on the stretchers, we began our arduous journey. The desert stretched out before us, vast and unyielding, its beauty marred by the violence that had just unfolded. After trekking approximately ten grueling miles through the rugged canyon, our weary group finally emerged onto the open desert. We trudged alongside the highway, a desolate stretch where no vehicles dared to travel. The heat was oppressive, its intensity unrelenting, as we took turns carrying our wounded comrades, our strength waning with every step. As dusk began to blanket the sky, we were on the verge of setting up camp when a flicker of lights in the distance caught our attention. In the heart of the desert stood a solitary structure. Drawing closer, we found ourselves before an old, yet beautifully crafted, Arab stone house. It was a two-story building with a small courtyard in front, and the doors stood invitingly open, illuminated by the warm glow of lights inside. I recognized it as a typical Syrian tavern, a haven for travelers braving the desert's harshness. The house featured a central courtyard enclosed by high walls, offering a secluded sanctuary. A fountain adorned its center, surrounded by lush greenery, a serene oasis amidst the sweltering desert. We cautiously entered the courtyard, where I noticed a bell next to the door. Ringing it, we were soon greeted by the house's owner. He appeared to be in his mid-forties, with a well-groomed beard and dark hair, slightly tinged with gray. His skin was weathered from the Syrian sun, giving him a rugged yet wise appearance. Dressed in traditional garb, a flowing robe and a taqiyya, he exuded a welcoming aura. He introduced himself as Muhammad. We explained our need for a room, water, and clean bandages to tend to our wounded. Muhammad's gaze swept over us, pausing briefly on the government officials. Then he nodded and soon returned with the requested items. We tended to the wounds, thankfully minor, and Muhammad then offered us a meal. The food was simple but nourishing. Unleavened bread, olives, laban, a thick sour milk believed to have healing properties, and Arab sandwiches, flatbreads filled with finely chopped onion, parsley, and bits of meat. We ate gratefully and thanked our host. He nodded in response and showed us to our rooms. The government officials took one room, while our squad divided among the remaining two. 
Soon, a peaceful quiet settled over the house. After everyone else had drifted off to sleep, I told Lieutenant Smith, who was on watch, that I wanted to explore the surroundings. Stepping outside into the cool night air, I felt a refreshing change from the day's blistering heat. The sky was a tapestry of stars, offering a moment of tranquility. I decided to walk around the house. As I rounded a corner, I stumbled upon a small grove of trees with a well at its center. Curious, I approached the well and peered inside. It was too dark to see the bottom, so I pulled out my flashlight and shined it down. To my horror, at the bottom lay a body that had clearly been there for some time. But what chilled me to the bone was the realization that the corpse belonged to Muhammad, the tavern owner I had just met. Gripping my rifle tightly, I rushed back to the rooms. Checking on my squad first, I found nothing amiss. However, upon entering the government official's room, I was met with a shocking scene. Mohammed stood in the center, staring at one of the officials who was pointing a gun at him. As I entered, Mohammed turned his head slightly towards me, then began to shake violently. His body contorted in unnatural ways, bones cracking and reshaping under his skin. The sight was both fascinating and horrifying. First, his face elongated, the jaw stretching forward, the skin rippling and contorting as if something underneath was struggling to break free. His eyes, once warm and inviting, now glowed with a feral yellow light, deep and wild. His mouth widened, lips tearing at the seams to accommodate the growing sharp teeth that emerged, dripping with saliva. The transformation was not just confined to his face. His limbs lengthened and thickened, muscles bulging and expanding in a grotesque display of power. His fingers elongated into claws, tearing through the fabric of his traditional robe. The sound of his clothing ripping was drowned out by the guttural growls emanating from his throat. His spine arched unnaturally as coarse dark fur sprouted all over his body, covering him in a thick animalistic pelt. The once stooped figure of a middle-aged man was now replaced by a hulking, beastly form towering over everyone in the room. As the transformation completed, the creature that stood before us was a terrifying sight to behold. A werewolf, a mythical being of strength and primal fury. It snarled, revealing a row of razor-sharp teeth, its eyes scanning the room with predatory hunger. The man we had known as Muhammad was gone, replaced by this monstrous entity, a creature of nightmares come to life. The official opened fire, and I quickly ducked for cover, so you don't get caught in the crossfire. The creature, now monstrous in form, lunged at one of the officials, biting deep into his throat. The others continued to fire, but their bullets seemed to have little effect. In a panic, they fled the room, leaping over me in their haste, except for one. The monster grabbed his leg, tearing into him with ferocious bites. Frozen in shock, I watched the gruesome scene unfold before regaining my senses and opening fire. Hearing the shots, the rest of my squad rushed in and joined the fray. The beast, agile and seemingly impervious to our bullets, leaped across the walls before smashing through a window and escaping into the night. Silence fell over the house, a haunting stillness that lingered long after the creature's departure. We inspected the victims of the attack, but unfortunately, they had succumbed to their injuries. Fear was evident in the eyes of every member of my squad as we looked around. We decided to barricade ourselves in a room until help arrived. According to the schedule, it should have been soon. I checked the GPS tracker. It was working perfectly. I sighed, overwhelmed by the day's shocking developments. While my subordinates were setting up inside, I decided to survey the surroundings, taking Lieutenant Smith with me. We left the house, scanning the area, aware that the creature could be lurking anywhere. The darkness was on its side. 
We circled the fountain and were heading towards the exit when a person emerged from around the corner of the fence. We quickly raised our weapons. It was Mr. Jefferson. He sighed with relief upon seeing us and approached. We kept our guns aimed at him, instructing him to raise his hands. Initially surprised, he then understood the situation and complied. I asked him to state his name, and he responded. Then I asked him to say my name. His answer was correct, but we weren't sure if the creature couldn't mimic memories. Meister Jefferson then approached us, claiming he was indeed himself. I grabbed him by the collar and demanded to know what was happening. Up to this point, I had been silent and hadn't asked him about the creature since we were in a hurry to leave the area, but now he needed to explain. He gently freed himself from my grip and sighing, began his story. They had received a message that locals had found a strange place, something like a tomb or burial site. When they arrived, they found this creature. It was something unreal, supernatural, belonging to no known species. It lay still as if dead, but upon taking samples, they realized it was still alive. They theorized that this creature might be the very ghoul from Arabian legends. The project was quickly classified, and they set up a camp near Palmyra to study it. They conducted experiments on it, trying to understand its nature. They did everything with it, but the creature had incredible regenerative abilities. This intrigued them even more, but then they began to notice signs of the creature awakening. A finger twitched, and when one of the workers saw this, he panicked, understandably, as we ourselves had seen how terrifying the monster was. Soon, when they continued their experiments, the creature opened one eye, surveyed each of them, and then closed it again. In shock, they realized it was time to transport the creature to a more secure and fortified location. Unfortunately, the area where the camp was located was in a no-fly zone due to terrorists controlling the airspace, making it dangerous to move by air. So they decided to transport it to Deir ez Zor and from there to our military base. It was decided to attract as little attention as possible and transport it with a small squad, but apparently, Someone leaked information about the cargo, though they did not know what we were transporting. As he finished his story, everything fell into place. The puzzle was complete. I began to process what had happened and let my guard down. I didn't notice when someone approached us. It was the last of Mr. Jefferson's surviving colleagues. His face was frightened, and he looked around nervously. Mr. Jefferson, relieved to see him alive, said, I'm glad you're alive, Jake, and went to pat his shoulder when Jake suddenly swung his hand, and Mr. Jefferson's head rolled onto the floor. I screamed and, raising my rifle, started shooting at the creature. Lieutenant Smith joined in, but the creature, having transformed back into the monster, swiftly jumped to the side and disappeared into the bushes. We kept firing as other soldiers came running out, but we ceased fire. Standing in the darkness, with only the dim light from the lamps illuminating the small courtyard, we were tense, scanning our surroundings. Suddenly, the creature leaped out of the bushes from the other side, flying towards me. Lieutenant Smith, fortunately reacting in time, hit the creature's side with his rifle butt. It saved me. The creature only managed to scratch me. A thin stream of blood trickled down my cheek. The creature flipped in midair and landed skillfully on its hind legs. It then looked at us and was about to attack again when the roar of a helicopter sounded in the sky and the lights of vehicles approached the inn. Backup had finally arrived. The creature noticed this and roared in frustration, then jumped, grabbed Mr. Jefferson's body, and disappeared into the night. We continued to shoot, but to no avail. We stood in shock, trying to digest what had happened. The realization came to me. This creature wanted to avenge those who had awakened it and experimented on it. 
Now it had vanished into the night, and we would likely never find it again. Story 3 It was a Sunday summer morning. I was standing in the supermarket parking lot waiting for my friend John. The parking lot was empty, as all normal people were still asleep. To get up so early on a weekend is a form of sadism that my friend fully possessed. Just a few days ago he called me while I was fixing another laptop at the computer repair service where I worked. Hey David, he said. I have good news for you this Sunday we're going camping out of town. I'll pass, I automatically refused. Heh, I knew you'd say that, but I have one argument that will make you agree. Guess who else is going with us? And who might that be? I grumbled. Emily, my tedious friend. The very Emily. She's coming with a friend. So, are you still not interested in going? Damn. John hit a sore spot. He knew I had been smitten with her for a long time. And so, getting up early in the morning, taking a shower and carefully grooming myself, I stood in the parking lot, waiting for the girl of my dreams. Soon, I saw my friend's pickup truck driving down the empty highway. It was painted in a deep black color, with fiery waves of red-orange shades on the sides of the body, creating an illusion of flames engulfing the car. On the hood was an imposing, aggressively-looking vinyl decal of a skull, surrounded by electric guitars and lightning. I think this car fully reflected the character of my friend a reckless guitarist of a heavy metal rock band. I remembered an incident that happened with him recently. Every year in our city there was an outdoor music festival that gathered many fans of rock music. Unable to resist the urge to impress the crowd, John decided to use his pickup as part of his performance. Armed with an electric guitar, he drove right onto the stage in his pickup at the moment when lightning and lights created by special effects flickered on the screens. Stopping right in front of the crowd, he turned up the volume of his audio system, transforming the pickup into an improvised stage. Then, standing on the roof of his pickup, John began to play a guitar solo, synchronizing his play with the thunderous riffs coming from the speakers of his vehicle. At that moment, the stage was lit up with bright spotlights, and artificial smoke began to pour from special installations, adding to the dramatic effect. John played as if possessed, astonishing everyone with his passion and skill. At the end of the performance, he pulled off an incredible stunt, jumping from the roof of the pickup right onto the stage, continuing to play the guitar. This incident was talked about for a long time, John was always the life of the party, a person whose cheerfulness and relentless energy attracted people to him. But once someone said that his quest for adventures would sooner or later end in trouble. I agreed with this, but couldn't do anything about it, as he was my only friend. When the pickup stopped next to me, a medium-height guy with long curly hair got out, with a confident smile on his face and his eyes sparkling with mischief and enthusiasm. He was dressed in a black t-shirt with a skull and worn jeans. This was John. He came up to me, slapped me on the shoulder, and asked how I was feeling. I replied that everything was okay, but my gaze at that time was fixed on the car's interior, from the back door of which two girls were exiting. First came out Emily. She was of short stature, with long hair of a soft chestnut shade, gathered in a loose bun. Her bright blue eyes drew attention with their simplicity and sincerity. After her came out her friend Sophia, a tall girl with long black loose hair, dressed all in black, emanating a gloomy atmosphere and appearing somewhat aloof. When Emily approached us, she responded to my greeting with a sweet and slightly embarrassed smile, while her friend merely nodded in greeting. We had barely started talking when a gray Prius silently drove into the parking lot. A slightly overweight guy with large, thick glasses got out. I knew him. It was Patrick, but everyone called him Professor because he was always studious and liked to share his knowledge, 
even when nobody asked him to. From the passenger seat, the last person I wanted to see got out. He was a blonde with neatly styled hair, blue eyes, and a confident smile. Many called him handsome, but only I knew how rotten the core of this playboy was. His name was Tyler, and I never liked him, which everyone knew, especially John. I shot John an angry look, to which he whispered in my ear, Sorry, dude, when I invited Emily. This guy was hanging around and started to invite himself. I couldn't refuse. I jabbed John in the ribs. What irritated me most about Tyler was that he was always hitting on Emily, who delicately brushed him off. But he didn't stop trying. Apparently, he decided not to miss this chance either. When we gathered in a circle, an awkward pause ensued, which of course was broken by John. So folks, we're going to a place a friend of my uncle told me about. The views are amazing. There's a river nearby. We'll set up camp there and have a blast. We nodded our heads without much enthusiasm. Before leaving, we went to the supermarket to stock up on food and drinks. In the outdoor equipment section, I noticed a bear spray, picked it up, and examined it. I heard a snort behind me. It was Tyler. Scared of bears, are you? He asked mockingly, laughing as he walked away. Idiot, I thought to myself, but still put the spray in the cart. Soon we loaded all our stuff into the bed of the pickup and set off. I sat in the passenger seat next to John. Luckily the girls were sitting in the back, and a disgruntled Tyler who had begged to come with us followed in his Prius. Soon we left the city with about 50 miles to our destination. The journey was pleasant. The road took us further away from city life, the environment becoming wilder and more untouched with each mile. Arriving at the site, we found a perfect place for camping. It was on a small hill with a view of a wide, gently flowing river. The water in the river was clean and cool, sparkling under the evening sun. Dense forests stretched along both sides of the river, creating a sense of seclusion and peace. We decided to set up camp in a small clearing surrounded by tall trees. There was enough space for our tents and a fire. The forest emitted soft sounds, rustling leaves, bird songs, and the distant noise of the river. The air was fresh, filled with the scents of pine and earth. After setting up the tents, we gathered firewood for the fire. It was around noon, and we decided to have lunch. Setting up the grill, we cooked some meat. Soon, a pleasant aroma spread around the area. Satisfied and content, John, belching and patting his stomach, which earned him a reproachful John from Emily, decided to break the silence. You know, guys, this place is cool, but my uncle told me about another spot nearby. Shall we take a walk and see what's interesting there? So that's the real reason we're here, I thought. In my experience, John's ideas never ended well, but I noticed curiosity and signs of approval on the others' faces, especially Emily's. Everyone started agreeing, and not wanting to be called a coward, I agreed too. Everyone began to gather for the journey. Just in case, I took a backpack with a compass, flashlight, water, and that bear spray. John also had a bag with him, shaped like it contained a large box. That made me wary. What was he planning? Soon, we set off on our journey. The forest was dense and impassable, filled with the whispers of leaves and mysterious sounds of nature. Following a narrow path, we made our way through the thick underbrush, where each step felt significantly harder than the last. The light filtering through the dense canopy of trees created a dappled pattern of light and shadow on the ground. Occasionally, we stopped to breathe in the fresh, fragrance-rich air of the forest and listened to the sounds surrounding us. The distant singing of birds, the rustle of small creatures hiding in the bushes, 
and the mysterious noise of the wind among the branches. As we progressed, the forest became denser and the path barely noticeable. In some places, we had to push our way through the thickets. After a long journey through the forest, we finally emerged onto a spacious clearing. Unexpectedly, an ancient wooden house, hidden among the trees, stood before us. It seemed remarkably well-maintained, despite its age. The house was made of dark wood, its roof covered in moss, and the windows adorned with carved shutters. We cautiously approached the house, taking in its details. The wooden planks of the walls were skillfully joined, and on the porch, there were antique, neatly arranged chairs and a small table. Everything around was quiet, with only a gentle breeze rustling the leaves. As we began to inspect the house, suddenly an elderly man emerged. His thick beard was silver gray, and his gaze was wise and penetrating. He was simply dressed in an old-fashioned shirt and worn trousers. His appearance slightly frightened us, especially the girls who hid behind our backs. Emily, to my delight, hid behind me. The man stopped on the threshold, looked at us attentively and said, You seem to be lost. Don't be afraid. I've lived here for a long time and have helped many lost tourists. You just need to head south now. There you'll see a trail. Just follow it and you'll come out to the highway. John intervened at this point. No, sir, we're not lost, just walking. We saw your house on the way and were surprised by it. Sorry to disturb you. Goodbye. And he turned and walked north. We uncertainly followed him. The man, seeing where we were going, shouted after us. Wait, don't go there, it might be dangerous. Don't worry, sir. We're just walking and we'll be back soon. John replied without looking back and continued on his way. The professor caught up with him and whispered, Maybe we should listen to that man. He's not warning us for nothing, right? Don't be afraid. My uncle's friend has been there a thousand times. And even if it's dangerous, it's so cool to find out what's happening there. John replied with gleaming eyes. My companions began to look at each other anxiously. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Caught in the web of my friend who constantly seeks adventures in risky places, I thought. I even started to feel guilty for not warning the others that this walk might be dangerous, as John was the initiator. Soon we disappeared behind the bushes. The man stood with his mouth open and hand raised. Then he waved it and muttered something like, I warned them. We continued on our way, John trying to lighten the mood, constantly joking, laughing loudly, and talking with the girls. I walked behind, envying how easily he could interact with people. I wanted to talk to Emily but didn't know where to start. My chance came a little later. I saw her lagging behind, looking for something on the ground. I approached to ask what she had lost. A bracelet. I knitted it recently, she replied. Like a knight, I rushed to search and soon found it. It was a beautiful knitted bracelet made of threads, showing that whoever made it had a decent talent in knitting. I was overjoyed, especially when she smiled at me with her bright smile. Thank you, she said. My grandmother taught me to knit. It's a kind of reminder of her. You're welcome, by the way. It's really nice. Maybe you could knit one for me as a thank you? I cheekily asked. She smiled and was about to reply when suddenly something stirred in the bushes. Something huge and hairy. It was hard to make out and say anything definite about it. Emily got scared and hid behind me. I assumed it might be a bear and reached into my bag for the spray. But then everything went quiet. Sophia and Tyler quickly approached us, asking, What are you doing here? While suspiciously glancing at us. Emily started to explain that she had lost her bracelet and I was helping her when we saw something resembling a bear in the bushes. A bear? John, who had just arrived, asked in surprise. 
there are no bears in this forest. Maybe it was a wild boar. Possibly, I replied uncertainly. But for a boar, it seemed too big. John walked into the bushes where we had seen the creature, then looked around but found nothing. He called us to follow him, as we were almost at the destination. Soon, John stopped and looked around. Giant pines surrounded us, completely blocking the sunlight, creating a semi-darkness. He bent down, searching for something on the ground, and soon let out a triumphant cry. He beckoned us over and showed us what he had found, a metal hatch. The earth around it was covered in moss and fallen leaves, making it almost invisible unless looked at closely. The hatch looked old and rusted, made of heavy metal, square in shape with a recessed handle for opening. There were no inscriptions or signs on it, only the marks of time and corrosion. John tried to open it, but it was locked. He then took off his backpack and pulled out a drill box marked 850 watts, claiming it could drill through any metal. Extracting the drill, he saw our surprised faces and explained that his uncle's friend had recently found this hatch and told John about it. After locating where the lock might be, he began drilling. We had no choice but to sit nearby and wait for him to finish. After about 20 minutes of drilling and constant tugging at the handle, the hatch gave way and opened. We gathered around the hole and looked inside. The hatch led deep down into impenetrable darkness. A vertical ladder made of rebar allowed descent. We looked at each other, waiting to see who would volunteer to go down first. Then everyone looked at John, as it was his idea. But suddenly Tyler volunteered, apparently wanting to show off in front of the girls. He took a flashlight and began descending. We all watched him. After a while, he disappeared into the darkness. We waited to see what would happen. After about five minutes with no news from Tyler, John leaned down and shouted into the hatch with all his might. Tyler? Suddenly, a beam of light hit him right in the face, indicating that there was still electricity in this place, to our surprise. Then we heard Tyler's voice, telling us to come down. John went down first, followed by the others. I was the last to go. To be honest, I didn't really want to get in there. I looked around. It seemed no one was around. But as my head was almost submerged in the hole, I caught a movement out of the corner of my eye. I stopped abruptly and stared into the bushes, but saw nothing. A bad feeling lingered with me. Sighing tiredly, I continued my descent. The depth of the shaft was about 30 feet, which seemed quite deep to me. Finally, I jumped onto the flat floor and looked around. We found ourselves in a long, narrow corridor. The walls, covered with pale gray tiles, were well preserved, although there were signs of time, chips and darkening here and there. Weak but working neon lights flickered on the ceiling, creating a gloomy but sufficient lighting for inspection. The floor was covered with linoleum, which in some places had peeled and curled, revealing the old concrete underneath. On both sides of the corridor were heavy metal doors with numbers and marks, many of which were covered in rust and dust. Some doors were slightly open, leading to rooms that once served as laboratory cabinets or experiment rooms. The glass in some doors was broken, revealing dark, abandoned spaces through them. Pipes and wires stretched along the entire length of the corridor, some of which had sagged or detached from the walls, evidencing long past days of activity. The air smelled of mold and old electronics, and the only sounds were our footsteps, and a distant hum coming from the unknown depths of the laboratory. The guys stood around, curiously looking around. It was surprising that this place was still functioning. I saw Tyler standing near the electrical panel with a proud look. The professor was particularly excited as he always liked such places. He entered one of the doors, then peeked out and beckoned us. 
When we entered, we saw an old laboratory. The room's walls were lined with old, peeling white tiles, showing signs of time and long-dried stains of unknown substances. In the center stood a long work table covered in a layer of dust. Scattered on the table were various laboratory implements. Test tubes, flasks, pipettes, all covered in a thick layer of dust and forgotten for years. In the corner of the room was a cabinet with many glass vials, many still sealed, containing unknown chemical compounds, colored solutions, and powders. Some vials were broken, their contents dried out, leaving multicolored traces on the shelves. An old microscope, covered in dust, stood on one side of the table, as if forgotten in the midst of an important experiment. Beside it were notes and records on scribbled sheets of paper, their ink faded, making the text barely legible. As we dispersed around the room, we began to explore everything. Sighs and exclamations of surprise filled the air, especially from the professor, who, excited by the discovery, nervously moved from one corner of the room to another. Meanwhile, I noticed John carefully putting some tools into his bag. Suddenly, there was a sound of breaking glass and a frightened scream. I turned sharply and saw Emily with a wounded finger, stained green from the liquid of a broken test tube, its shards on the floor. Rushing over to her, I took out a bottle of water and a bandage to immediately rinse the wound and prevent infection. After all, no one knew what was in the test tube. After carefully treating the wound and bandaging it, I sighed in relief, seeing that the injury was not serious. Emily smiled at me gratefully, and I felt an incredible happiness at being able to help. Making sure everything was fine, John warned everyone to be more careful. We continued our exploration. Exiting into the corridor, we began to peek into each room in turn, but there was nothing interesting in them. Suddenly, we heard a loud, frightened scream. We turned around and saw it was Sophia, who had burst out of one of the rooms we hadn't checked yet. Her face was frightened, and she was trembling. We asked what was in there, but she didn't answer right away, instead tremblingly pointing her finger at the door. There. There. Something terrible. I... I can't, she stammered. You need to see it for yourselves. We decided to check it out and cautiously entered the room. Our reactions varied upon seeing what was inside. John whistled in surprise. Tyler jumped back in fright. The professor fell to the floor trembling. Emily screamed in fear and covered her mouth with her hands. And I simply stared dumbfounded and mesmerized at what was before us. Before us stood a huge capsule, about ten feet in diameter, filled with a shimmering green liquid. Inside, in this mysterious substance, floated a gigantic head, resembling that of a wolf but many times larger and with clear differences from a normal animal. This head looked more like a monster from a fantasy tale, with sharp fangs and terrifying, unnatural features. To understand its size, imagine an adult man stretching his arms wide but still unable to fully embrace it. Around the capsule were numerous wires connected to various devices and screens that flickered and displayed various data and graphs. These screens apparently monitored the condition or some parameters of the capsule and its contents. The room was filled with dim light from the monitors and the soft glow of the liquid in the capsule, creating a gloomy and mysterious atmosphere. We stood there, stunned by the sight trying to comprehend the nature of this experiment and its purpose. When we regained our composure, John took out his phone and started recording. We moved closer to examine the head inside. Up close, it seemed even more realistic and terrifying. Have you ever been to a zoo and seen a tiger? It seems like just a big cat on TV, but when you stand next to it, you realize it's indeed a huge beast. Here was a giant head, so how big was the body? Was this a monster the size of a dinosaur? Maybe it was a mock-up? Possibly, 
but the head was too realistic. These were the kinds of thoughts swirling in our minds. Speaking or making noise in this atmosphere felt dangerous. It seemed that if we did something wrong, this creature might awaken. We stood for a while longer, studying everything around us, then decided to leave. As I was leaving the room, I swear I thought the monster looked in our direction. I caught the slightest movement of its pupil, and in fright, I recoiled and quickly decided to leave the room. The guys looked at me in surprise, but I just shrugged and said nothing, not wanting to seem cowardly. I saw that the guys were getting nervous, and there were suggestions to return, but John insisted on exploring a couple more rooms. Reluctantly, everyone agreed. Continuing down the corridor, we found an evacuation plan and realized the laboratory was simply enormous. We had explored only a small part of it. The professor pointed out a room labeled Archive. We decided to go there. Soon we found the right door and entered. The room was spacious, with high ceilings and shelves covered with old books, documents, and boxes. The shelves held stacks of dusty folders, films, and old reels with recordings. The air in the archive was heavy with the smell of old paper and metal. In one corner of the archive stood a device for viewing video, an old film projector, which it seemed could still work. Next to it was a table with several film reels. These reels were neatly labeled, and we realized they could provide valuable information about the laboratory's past research. After examining the reels, we chose one labeled Overall Analysis and Conclusions. We prepared the projector for use and inserted the reel. Upon turning on the device, the archive wall turned into a screen, displaying frames of an old film. The image was black and white, slightly shaky, but clear enough to discern details. We held our breath in anticipation of discovering the secrets hidden in these ancient recordings. An image appeared on the screen of a man in a white lab coat standing next to a huge capsule who seemed vaguely familiar to me. To date, it has been 65 days since the beginning of our research, he began his report. We have discovered that the head in the capsule is alive, but it does not respond to external stimuli. However, our experiments with its blood have shown astonishing results. On the screen, the scientist paused sighed, and continued. This blood contains a virus that interacts with human DNA, causing genetic changes, leading to physical transformation. Unfortunately, we discovered this due to a tragic accident when one of our scientists had direct contact with the blood of this creature. After two hours, a transformation occurred after which the victim took on the appearance of a wolf-like anthropomorphic being and began attacking everyone around. We barely managed to eliminate this creature and soon began studying how to fight this virus. Suddenly, the image on the screen shook and the video jumped forward in time. We have developed an antidote, the scientist continued, holding a vial labeled HN13. It must be administered within the first two hours after infection to prevent transformation. Early signs of infection include a sharp rise in body temperature, changes in eye color, accelerated hair and nail growth, as well as increased physical strength and aggressiveness. We sat opposite the screen, listening intently to what the scientist was saying. To my right sat Emily. I looked at her and she noticed smiling back at me with her warm smile. My heart froze in fear. Her eyes, always so clear and kind, had suddenly changed. They had become bright yellow gold, reminiscent of a predator's eyes, reflecting light in a way that momentarily left me speechless. At first I couldn't believe what I was seeing, remembering the scientist's words about the change in eye color. Emily saw my reaction and became frightened, asking, What's wrong? Is there something on me? Your, your eyes? It was hard for me to say. 
a heavy burden of bad news weighed on my heart. The others turned around, hearing our conversation. Sophia gasped in horror, covering her mouth with her hand. Tyler rushed to Emily, grabbed her shoulders, and looked into her eyes. Then he stepped back in fright. Emily pulled a small mirror from her purse and brought it to her face with trembling hands. Then she looked long into her eyes and tears streamed down her cheeks. Apparently, the vial from which she had cut herself contained the blood of this creature. We all sat in stunned silence, not knowing what to do. I approached her and hugged her. She buried her face in my shoulder and sobbed loudly. My chest ached as I recalled the scientist's words about the antidote. I gently pulled away from Emily and headed to the projector. Rewinding the tape, I stopped the image at the moment the scientist held the vial. I pointed at it. We must find it within an hour and a half, as half an hour has passed since the infection. The vial with the label HN13, let's split up, each taking a wing of the building. A spark of hope appeared in me, which spread to the others. Even Tyler nodded in agreement. We divided the areas among the five of us, leaving Emily to sit in the archive. I set the timer on my watch and ran with all my might. Every second was crucial. Soon I was at the door labeled Experimental Laboratory 37, and I burst into the room. A grim atmosphere filled with shadow and cold enveloped me. Around me stood rows of capsules, each containing dead chimeras submerged in green liquid. These motionless beings, a chaotic mix of different animal parts, were a reminder of the horrific experiments conducted here many years ago. The air smelled of rot and chemicals, making my throat constrict in disgust. I had no time to examine the contents, my head spinning in search of the antidote. But it was nowhere to be found. Suddenly, I noticed a dark figure moving in the shadows. I quickly hid behind the nearest table, my heart pounding. When I dared to look out, a terrible creature pounced on me. Its eyes blazed with yellow flame, and its sinister fangs glinted in the flickering light. Its fur was dark and thick, muscles twitching with rage and strength. I instinctively fended it off, jumping back. The beast lunged again, its powerful body smashing the capsules, dousing everything with green liquid. Glass flew in all directions, and the grotesque creatures flopped onto the floor. I thought it was the end, but at the last moment, I remembered the bear spray in my bag. Grabbing it, I quickly turned around and sprayed the creature in the face. The spray worked. The werewolf howled in pain and fury knocked the spray from my hands and broke it. Clutching its disfigured face, it fled into the darkness of the corridor. What was that? I stood in shock, amidst the devastated laboratory. I breathed heavily as after a run, trying to calm down, get my thoughts in order. Could there be more infected here? I needed to warn the others, but first, I thoroughly searched all corners, yet the antidote was not found. I rushed out into the corridor, but it was empty. I remembered that everyone had dispersed throughout the building and searching for them now would be problematic. Glancing at my watch, I felt the urgency of time pressing. Hoping that the others were okay, I ran, checking every office along the way. Finding nothing, I began to think about what to do next. Standing in the middle of the corridor, I suddenly heard a terrible, desperate scream of pain. I ran towards it and saw that Sophia, Tyler, and John had also gathered there. It was as if I had been plunged into icy water. The professor was missing, and it was apparently he who had screamed. My companions exchanged frightened glances and John asked, What is happening? I didn't explain but rushed into the room from where the scream had come. It was a large room, completely filled with archival documents neatly placed on shelves, arranged in rows like a library. The shelves stretched along the walls and through the entire space, creating narrow passages between them. 
A faint smell of old paper and dust hung in the air, and the dim light from sparse lamps gave the room a semi-darkness and a sense of mystery. Together with the others, I cautiously navigated between the rows of shelves, searching for any traces of the professor. However, what we found was worse than any of our fears. Behind one of the rows, in a recess between the shelves, we found the body of my friend. It was brutally mutilated, as if attacked by a monster. Pages and documents were scattered around, creating chaos and disorder. The floor was stained with blood, which had not yet fully dried, and the air was filled with a sharp, metallic smell. This discovery petrified us with horror and grief. Sophia trembled with fear, her face pale. Tyler sat down, trying to comprehend what had happened, while John stood in the corner, nervously twirling a flashlight in his hands. He might have been blaming himself for bringing us here. I sighed and told them what had happened earlier. They listened to me and were terrified. Sophia turned around and said we should run and call for help. I thought it was a wise decision. But then we wouldn't be able to save Emily. It was selfish of me. But I could only think of her. Tyler volunteered to go with Sophia, and John and I decided to stay and continue the search, when suddenly a menacing growl echoed. We quickly turned around. Danger was near. Sophia panicked and ran towards the exit. We followed her. The corridor was empty. In haste, Sophia headed towards the hatch through which we had entered, and Tyler followed her. John and I stood, pondering where the antidote could be. Suddenly we heard a noise and simultaneously looked up. Something was crawling on the ceiling, or rather inside the ventilation system. John and I exchanged looks and realized how this creature was moving. And with horror, we understood that it was heading in the same direction as Sophia and Tyler. We ran after them. I looked at my watch. There were only 30 minutes left. A lump formed in my chest. Would we be able to save Emily in time? The creature moved very quickly, and soon the noise in the ventilation ceased somewhere ahead. We ran with all our might, rounding corners and trying to speed up. When we almost reached the hatch, at the end of a long corridor, we saw the werewolf pounce on Tyler, who was fighting it off with all his strength. To our horror, we found Sophia's body lying next to where the fight was taking place. John sped up even more and kicked the creature against the wall. It hit the wall and fell onto its side. The werewolf began to slowly rise on its hind legs, growling heavily. Meanwhile, I rushed to Tyler and helped him up. We stood there facing each other, waiting to see who would make the first move. The werewolf breathed heavily, its chest rising and falling with green fluid dripping from its mouth. We noticed it slightly crouching, ready to pounce, and suddenly it leaped towards us. But at that moment we heard a noise as if someone had fallen from a height onto a marble floor, followed by gunshots. The werewolf was shot mid-air and splattering green blood fell right in front of us. Twitching in convulsions it emitted a pitiful moan and died. In shock we turned around. To our side, near the staircase and exit, stood the same elderly man we had met in the house in the forest. In his hands, he held a large double-barreled shotgun, smoke wafting from its barrel. He approached the creature, bent down to make sure it was dead, then stood up and went over to Sophia, checked her pulse, and with a sigh of regret, he told us she had passed away. The three of us stood there, sadly looking at the girl's body. The man broke our contemplation. We need to leave quickly. It's not safe here. I was about to thank him for the rescue and tell him about Emily. But when I looked closely at his face, I remembered where I had seen him. The professor in the recording was our savior. I rushed to him and grabbed his sleeve. Sir, it's urgent. Where can we find the antidote? Our friend. She's infected. You have to help us. 
He gently pushed me away and after a heavy sigh slung his shotgun over his shoulder and wearily said, It's gone. The last doses were destroyed and the scientist who developed it lies before you. We looked confusedly at the werewolf's corpse and the man continued, This happened 30 years ago. There was a catastrophe here then. What? How can it be gone? I cried out in despair. Then I looked at my watch. There were only 15 minutes left. I turned and ran to the archive where Emily was supposed to be waiting. Behind me, I heard the man shouting, trying to stop me, but I kept running. He had no choice but to follow me. Soon we arrived at the location. I rushed into the office, but to my horror, found no one. I desperately called out Emily's name, but there was no response. I was about to run out to search for her, but the man grabbed me tightly so I couldn't break free. I glared at him angrily, but he said, Calm down. I need to explain to you. It's too late to do anything. By going out to search, you'll only put yourself at risk. I tried to break free from his grip, but John and Tyler approached and put their hands on my shoulders. I was angry and wanted to hit these traitors, but John quietly said, Calm down, friend. Let's listen to what he has to say. Reluctantly, I nodded my head and they loosened their grip. The man then let me go, stood opposite us, and began his story. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Alexander Weiss, and I used to work as a geneticist at the local university. We were engaged in studying the genetic foundations of diseases and everything related to it, uncovering the complex interrelations between heredity and health. He put down his shotgun on the table and started pacing the room, reminiscing about the past. So one day, a man approached me. As far as I knew, he was very rich and influential. Before telling me what he wanted from me, I was required to sign a non-disclosure agreement. That's when I understood it was serious. They sent a car for me, and we went to the mountains nearby, where there was an abandoned mine. The place was cordoned off, surrounded by armed guards. They searched me and led me inside. Descending deep enough, we arrived at an entrance formed by a collapsed wall leading to a huge cave. When I entered the cave, an astounding sight unfolded before me. It resembled an ancient temple. The walls were adorned with mysterious symbols and drawings depicting animals, astronomical signs, and incomprehensible scripts. The feeling that each symbol carried a part of a long-forgotten history permeated the air. In the center of the cave, on a stone altar-like structure, lay a huge wolf's head. Its powerful fangs and dark fur with unusual markings evoked a mix of fear and awe. The head's eyes were closed, as if the creature was frozen in time, like a sacred artifact or an object of worship. Around the altar, various objects seemed to be used in ancient rituals. Old vessels, stone knives, and amulets. The dim light, seeping into the cave through narrow cracks, created a mystical atmosphere, and I felt every step here was filled with mystery and ancient magic. I was sent here to study what this creature was and what it was capable of, and I got to work. Day in, day out, we conducted experiments, uncovering new information that stirred the mind. Soon this laboratory was built, where we continued the study until the first case of infection occurred. That's when we realized the monster's blood contained a virus that could change human DNA and turn them into a monster. Fairy tales and myths were becoming reality, and it both frightened and inspired us. One day I noticed the head was still alive, meaning I had previously discovered it showed signs of life but had no consciousness, like a vegetable. But then, one day, I saw the head react to my movements. It did so covertly, so I wouldn't notice. It scared me so much I couldn't sleep for days. I couldn't imagine what would happen if this monster woke up. I tried to avoid getting too close to it, but I didn't notice one thing. My colleague, Leonard Hoffman, was always near it. 
He was a brilliant scientist who invented the antidote serum. Apparently, he either came into contact with the head or fell under its control, I don't know for sure. What's important is that he deliberately infected himself. And it happened on the day the owner of this laboratory arrived. All employees, the entire staff, the laboratory, and the owner gathered in the conference hall. Yes, it was a trap. Fifteen minutes before this, Leonard asked me to check the monster's head. I went to the laboratory, while in the conference hall a massacre took place. Leonard locked all the doors and having transformed into a monster, began killing. No one survived. When I returned to the conference hall, I saw a mountain of bodies. Suddenly, Leonard, in his monstrous form, attacked me. Fortunately, I always carried with me a weapon that repelled these creatures, which we had developed earlier. I barely managed to escape. When I returned fully armed, the monster had escaped. I didn't know what to do. If I had reported this laboratory to the government, it could have led to a disaster, as the virus in this head's blood was extremely infectious. I decided to close the laboratory and settled nearby, tracking and hunting Leonard. For 30 years I failed, but today it finally happened. That's roughly what happened here. But I want to highlight a couple of points from my observations. Over these years, Leonard became much weaker. Their peak strength is at the beginning of the transformation. Secondly, before transforming, they become quite vulnerable, lose their minds, and move purely on instincts, which is why they start hiding and can be impossible to find. That's why I didn't let you go, as we would have just lost you in the depths of this laboratory. We listened to his story in shock, as if it were torn from the pages of a fantasy novel. I remembered Emily, recalled how kind and sweet she was, how brightly she smiled, and my heart clenched in pain. Dr. Weiss continued, Now you understand why we need to leave this place. That head is alive and extremely dangerous, but I must stay and kill the creature that was your friend. After the transformation, they become extremely insane and less cautious, so this is a chance to put an end to her suffering. Then he stood up, took his shotgun, and walked out. I couldn't believe my ears and rushed after him. Wait, can't we avoid killing her? Maybe she can be cured, I asked hopefully. No, she could have been cured before the transformation, but not after. Dr. Weiss turned around and looked at me deeply, then placed his hand on my shoulder and said, I understand it's hard to lose someone dear to you, but you need to take control and accept that the girl you loved is no longer there. Now go to the exit. I have a duty to fulfill. I stood in thought, not knowing what to do, when my friends approached and said it was time to leave. I watched Dr. Weiss walk down the corridor, when suddenly from an open door, a monster jumped on him. It happened so quickly that we couldn't react in time, and Dr. Weiss's head rolled on the ground as blood spurted from his neck. The monster then approached the corpse, stood on its hind legs, and growled. We stood petrified, unable to move. The werewolf turned to us, slowly opening its formidable jaws full of sharp, gigantic fangs. Its fur, colored a chestnut shade just like Emily's hair, fluttered gently in the airflow created by the working fan. God, Emily, what has become of you? I thought sadly. Suddenly the monster charged at us, and we reacted by rushing into the nearest room, slamming the door shut. A loud bang sounded and the door trembled. The monster growled in disappointment and then quieted down. We sighed in relief, but then heard noise above us. Something was moving through the ventilation, then just a few dozen feet away from us. The ventilation grate fell to the floor, followed by the werewolf jumping down. In panic, we dashed to the door we had just closed. 
My heart pounded in my chest as I struggled with the lock. Finally, with relief, I heard the click. The door opened. We scattered in different directions. I chose an office opposite. Where the others ran to, I couldn't see. My entire world narrowed down to the pursuing monster. It seemed to have chosen me as its target, crashing with enormous force into the door behind which I was hiding. It was the very same room where Dr. Weiss met his end. This time the werewolf didn't seek a path through the ventilation. It decided to simply break down the barrier. I stood, unable to take my eyes off as the creature repeatedly threw itself at the door until it broke through. Without waiting for it to enter, I ran along the shelves. Hiding in a corner, I crouched, trying to make my breathing quieter. I felt the presence of the werewolf, its heavy steps causing the walls to tremble. With each of its movements, dust rose in the air, creating ghostly shadows. It seemed to me that I could hear its breathing, low and steady, like the sound of an approaching storm. My heart pounded wildly as I slowly moved from one hiding spot to another, trying not to make any noise. I felt adrenaline filling my veins, fear present in every cell of my body. Suddenly, a loud noise erupted. The werewolf had found my hiding place. It growled, its eyes glinting in the darkness, reflecting a yellow light like burning coals. It lunged forward, smashing everything in its path, its claws scraping against the metal shelves. In desperation, I ran out of my hiding spot, dashing across the room towards the exit. The werewolf followed, its roar filling the space, making my blood run cold. I threw a last glance over my shoulder, seeing the enormous creature tearing through obstacles as if they were made of paper. With my last ounce of strength, I burst out of the room, the werewolf hot on my heels, its steps growing closer. A sharp sound of gunfire shattered the silence, one shot, then another. The monster let out a prolonged howl of pain and fury. Turning around, I saw John, armed with Dr. Weiss's shotgun, shooting at the werewolf. The wounded beast, despite its injuries, charged at John with incredible speed, knocking him down. The werewolf slowly, like a predator, approached John, preparing to deliver a fatal blow. In desperation, I rushed to them and grabbed the shotgun. The monster stopped, meeting my gaze. Tyler burst out from behind me, yelling at me to shoot. One shot in the head and she's dead! His voice sounded like a sentence. But I hesitated. Tyler was also in love with Emily, and now he was demanding that I kill her. Standing indecisively, I watched as the werewolf turned its attention back to John. A gunshot sounded. Smoke rose from the barrel of the shotgun. I missed. I didn't want to hit. The werewolf met my gaze and I swear somewhere deep in its eyes, I saw the same warm look that belonged to the one I loved. With a growl, the creature fled into the darkness of the corridor. Exhausted and overwhelmed with emotions, I approached John. He was injured, but not fatally. Probably a few broken ribs. I helped him up draping his arm over my shoulder, supporting him as we walked. Tyler walked beside us, holding the shotgun I had handed him, cautiously looking around. Soon we left the place. In the forest, as soon as my phone got a signal, we called for rescuers. After a while, the laboratory was cordoned off. John was taken to the hospital, and people in strict suits, claiming to be FBI agents, began to interrogate us. We told them everything, just to get it all over with. In the end, they asked me to sign a non-disclosure agreement. I told them to go to hell. But to my surprise, they didn't insist much, probably thinking nobody would believe such a story. They, of course, took our phones. After finishing everything in the department corridor, I saw Emily's parents. They looked very sad because they were told their daughter had died. I stood at a distance, 
not finding the strength to approach them and confess that their daughter, transformed into a monster, was now roaming somewhere in the depths of the forest. Story 4 The humid air of the jungle envelops me, filling my lungs with the scent of earth and wild nature. I move slowly, trying not to make unnecessary noise, for my goal is the Black Jaguar, a master of camouflage and stealth. The handle of the rifle in my hands feels like an extension of my body, though my palms are covered in a thin layer of sweat. Holding my breath, I pause to look around. The sun barely penetrates through the dense canopy of trees, creating patches of light and shadow on the ground. Here, in the heart of the jungle, every sound makes me tense. Every movement in the bushes makes me turn around. But I know my target is close. Suddenly, my attention is drawn to a barely perceptible rustle to my right. I slowly turn my head, trying not to startle the beast. And there, in the shadows, I see it. Its eyes gleam in the semi-darkness, and it watches me motionlessly, as if assessing. My hand instinctively tightens around the trigger. Tension hangs between us. I know I cannot afford even a moment of hesitation. The jaguar could vanish as suddenly as it appeared. I aim, holding my breath, time slowing down. And then I press the trigger. The sound of the shot shatters the jungle silence, echoing among the trees. The animal falls, its powerful body weakening and slumping onto the damp ground. In that moment, I feel a mixture of relief and sadness. But it had to be done. This predator had been terrorizing the local village. It had already taken five children, and who knows how many more it could have taken. I brought the carcass back to the village and handed it over to the village elder. After making notes for my book, I bid farewell to the grateful villagers. The task was done, and I could return back home to the States. A couple of days later, I was already in my home state of Wyoming. As I approached my house, I noticed a black Ford parked opposite. When I walked up to it, a tall man in a suit and black sunglasses emerged from it. He looked like a spy from the movies. The man extended his hand and introduced himself. His name was Alex Red, and he worked for the FBI. He asked me to accompany him as the agency had a task for me. Surprised but not refusing, I left my camping gear at home and got into the car with him, heading off in an unknown direction. Soon we arrived at a small gray building. Parking beside it, we got out of the car. A serious-looking guard stood at the entrance, conducting a thorough check before allowing us to proceed. Passing through narrow corridors, we entered a small room where several other people were already present. Among them was a woman around 40, dressed modestly, and a man about 35 wearing a hat. At a table nearby sat another man, roughly my age, dressed in khaki clothing. We entered and Alex gestured for me to take a seat. Then he approached the screen in the center of the room and began to explain why he had gathered us. Firstly, before you, there's a contract you must sign, he said. It states that what's said here must not be disclosed, as it's classified information. Breach of confidentiality could lead to imprisonment. I took the sheet and read it carefully. It was serious business, and as a former military man, I was familiar with such procedures. After reading it a couple of times, I signed and handed it back to the agent. My neighbors did the same. Alex took the sheets, checked the signatures, and placed them in a cabinet. Then he went to the switch and turned off the lights. Next, he turned on a projector, which displayed an image on the screen. It was a man, about 25 years old, with a beard, wearing an ordinary shirt. He stood in a room with light shining directly on his face. Nothing remarkable, except for his gaze. Squinting from the light, he looked into the camera with hatred, as if he had seen his fiercest enemy. 
Then Alex switched the slide, and the photo we saw shocked us. The woman sighed and leaned back, while I held my breath. Surprisingly, both men reacted calmly, with one of them just tilting his head slightly. I looked back at the screen. It was the same room, but instead of the man, there stood a creature. It was a werewolf, a real one, the kind often depicted in horror movies, suitable only for fiction. It was incredibly grotesque, resembling more of an alien than a human. Thick gray fur and an elongated muzzle with an open mouth full of large, sharp teeth. Its appearance shocked me. As an experienced hunter, I had never encountered anything like it. Alex glanced at our reactions, then stood by the screen and began to explain what it was all about. The creature you see on the screen is a real werewolf. They come in different types. There are harmless ones that quietly live in the forests, and there are those who start killing people. The werewolf you see on the screen can be classified as the latter. This type of werewolf we've named lycanthropies, as they transmit the disease lycanthropy. It's highly contagious. One bite and you're infected. Then, when the full moon rises, you transform into a monster. You lose all control and move purely on instincts, which demand only one thing from you, to kill. We listened in astonishment, as our perception of the world was undergoing a radical change. It seemed like legends were coming to life. Alex continued, The government has been monitoring these creatures for a long time. Fortunately, they appear quite rarely. The last recorded case was 20 years ago. When such incidents occur, we hire experienced hunters and animal specialists to catch these beasts. Although it's a monster, it's also a human being, specifically a citizen of the United States. So we classify them as patients. Therefore, you must try to capture them alive. This will also help us study their disease, as after death they become ordinary humans and all signs of lycanthropy disappear. This is a very dangerous mission, so the government is willing to pay each of you $500,000 for a live captured beast. We glanced at each other. It was a substantial amount, but the risks were also significant. Alex asked, So, are you ready to take on this job? If not, then leave this room, but you must forget what was said here. No one moved. Each of us had different reasons. Some were attracted by the money, some had purely scientific interest. As a hunter, I was intrigued by the new challenge. Could I catch this creature or not? The agent glanced at us and continued. I see everyone agrees. Then let's start with introductions. I'll list the names and occupations of each of you. First is Jack Rivers. The man in the hat nodded his head. Former park ranger has encountered one of them before, although not a lycanthrop, but it was no less dangerous. Sophia Harper, the woman waved her hand amiably. Zoologist, works at Stanford University in California, specializing in rare species. John Hawkins, the man in khaki raised his hand. Former military also had experience encountering a werewolf. Stanley Morrison, I raised my finger, also a former military, now an experienced hunter. As far as we know, you've been to all continents and have hunted many dangerous animals. Since you're the most experienced in this matter, you're appointed as the senior. During this mission, this building will be your base and will provide you with weapons and everything you need. Now let's finally get down to business. Our target is in the Rocky Mountains, hiding in the forest at their foothills. We don't know who the person behind the werewolf mask is, so you need to be careful. At the moment, three deaths have been registered in this area. All the evidence points to our client, to our horror or fortune, but all the victims died. Otherwise, this virus could have spread further. You can imagine if there were more such creatures and they started biting everyone indiscriminately. You will set out tomorrow, but first I'll show you to your rooms. 
and you'll have time to get to know each other better. That concluded our conversation. Alex handed us more papers to sign, outlining our fees and absolving the government of responsibility in case of our death. Then he led us along. We entered a spacious living room, greeted by the warm glow of soft lighting and a cozy atmosphere, which immediately created a sense of homely comfort. There were four doors in the living room, each leading to a separate bedroom, lined along the walls of the room. Without hesitation, I headed towards the furthest left door, deciding that it would be my temporary refuge. Opening the door, I found a cozy room decorated in muted tones with a soft carpet underfoot and heavy curtains on the windows, which, like guards, prevented even the slightest draft from entering. In the center of the room stood a large bed with pristine white covers, inviting me to rest after a long journey. Next to the bed was a small table with a desk lamp, creating the perfect spot for reading before sleep. Since I didn't have any belongings with me, I simply looked around and then returned to the living room, where my companions were already discussing something. As I approached, they turned to me, and we officially greeted each other. After that, Sophia asked, We were just discussing the reasons why each of us was invited here. Jack and John had previously encountered a werewolf. Have you ever encountered them before? No, not once have I even heard of such a thing. I think I was chosen because of my hunting skills, I said. I would like to hear what you know about them. It would help me learn more about their habits and prepare. My companions exchanged glances and Jack began. I encountered or rather survived an encounter with one of them when I was working as a park ranger. That day we were patrolling our territory with my partner when a plane fell from the sky. They were smugglers and the werewolf was on their plane. It was significantly different from what we were shown, both in appearance and behavior. Unlike a lycanthrope, it didn't transform into a human. I think it was some kind of mutant or an unknown species. I managed to survive that incident, but unfortunately, my partner didn't. We nodded silently, understanding that every time a person encounters such creatures, there are casualties. Sophia continued. I've never personally encountered werewolves, but after my colleagues' trip to Japan, their behavior changed dramatically. They returned completely different people and avoided talking about their experiences there. After persistent questioning, one of them finally shared the secret. They encountered werewolves. At first I was skeptical about their story, but then, Delving into the study of this topic, I found plenty of confirmations of such encounters on the internet. This prompted me to create a database and start studying the folklore of various cultures. From America to Asia, I found mentions of werewolves, which only strengthened my belief in the reality of these creatures. My research continued until one day an FBI agent called me and now I'm here. I silently listened to their stories which were fascinating. John continued, In the deserts of Syria, I encountered one of them. We were transporting cargo, inside of which, as it turned out, was one of these creatures. Unfortunately, it managed to break free, resulting in many casualties. This creature was noticeably different from what we were shown today. As he finished his story, we began to ponder the information we had received. It turned out that there are many varieties of werewolves, and we were about to encounter the most dangerous of them. At that moment, Alex entered the living room, holding a folder in his hands. He approached me and handed it to me, noting that the folder contained all the information about werewolves that they had been able to gather up to that day. Studying the provided information, we discovered the following. People bitten by werewolves experience a desire to relocate to less populated areas, likely influenced by instinct. This may serve as a defensive measure, as they are more quickly recognized and eliminated in densely populated areas. 
The infected transform into werewolves at midnight during a full moon, meaning they transform once a month. Unlike common myths where the werewolf returns to human form at dawn, werewolves maintain their beastly form for three days. During this period, they can use it for hunting and infecting others. It was also described that werewolves possess significant physical strength and agility, making hunting them particularly dangerous. Their main vulnerability is silver, which can kill them. However, a special silver-based drug has been developed that can weaken werewolves without killing them. After discussing the new information, we dispersed to our rooms, ready to set out at dawn the next day. A minute before the alarm was supposed to go off, I was already up. Years of hunting practice had taught me to wake up at strictly appointed times. Getting up, I washed my face, and then headed to the kitchen to make coffee. Sophia was already there, engrossed in reading documents from the folder. While I spread jam on toast, she asked, How dangerous do you think our mission will be? Any hunt for large game involves risks, I replied, chewing on a piece of toast. But considering you don't have physical training, it would be better for you to coordinate our group without participating directly in the hunt. Maybe I should at least learn the basics? Could you teach me? She suggested hopefully. Hmm, perhaps, if there's time, I reluctantly agreed. Sophia smiled happily, set the folder aside, and poured herself some coffee. It wasn't long before the other members of our team woke up as well. Shortly after we finished our morning discussion, Alex entered the kitchen. His appearance immediately caught our attention as his expression and determined gaze heralded the beginning of serious preparation. It's time for you to see the armory, he said, gesturing for us to follow him. We followed Alex through the narrow corridors of the building until we reached a massive door. With ease, he unlocked it and led us inside, where we were greeted by a sight worthy of admiration. The walls of the armory were adorned with a wide variety of weapons, and equipment for hunters was neatly arranged on shelves. The arsenal included both modern firearms and more exotic weapons designed specifically for combating unusual adversaries such as werewolves. Alex began to explain the purpose of each item, emphasizing the features that might be useful in our mission. He showed us lightweight but sturdy jackets and vests capable of withstanding bites and scratches, as well as various devices for night vision and tracking. We marveled at the presented equipment, assessing each item. Alex allowed us to try on and select the necessary gear, paying particular attention to selecting weapons that would best suit each of us based on our skills and experience. These are tranquilizer bullets specifically designed to immobilize werewolves without killing them, he explained, pointing to the bullets wrapped in blue shells. And these are silver bullets. They can kill such creatures. Use them only as a last resort if you find yourself in mortal danger. As I mentioned earlier, it is crucial for us to capture them alive. After changing into expeditionary clothing, we stepped outside where our transport awaited us, a sturdy off-road vehicle. Looking around, I noticed that our group looked like seasoned hunters, which shouldn't raise any suspicions from outsiders. Leaving the hustle and bustle of the city behind, we headed towards the remote corners of the Rocky Mountains. Traveling in the off-road vehicle allowed us to traverse diverse landscapes, from green meadows strewn with flowers to dense forests. As we approached the mountains, the landscape became increasingly grandiose. Tall peaks, covered with snow even in the warmest time of the year, loomed before us, creating the impression of unconquered giants. The road wound its way among hills and valleys, offering us magnificent views. We crossed small rivers and streams, their crystal clear water reflecting the sky. The air here was clean and fresh, filled with the scents of pine and earth, 
making every deep breath particularly pleasant. Once we stopped at the edge of the forest at the foot of the Rocky Mountains, we were greeted by a ranger named Thomas Hale. His snug-fitting uniform accentuated his sturdy build, and deep wrinkles around his eyes spoke of many years spent outdoors. Approaching us, Thomas respectfully shook each of our hands. We introduced ourselves and explained to him the purpose of our arrival. Our group had come here on behalf of the government to search for and neutralize the beast responsible for attacks on people in this area. Thomas listened attentively, his gaze occasionally shifting from one to another of us, as if assessing our readiness to face the task. He confirmed that he had heard about the recent incidents and expressed his concern about the safety of both the local residents and the newcomers. The ranger shared invaluable information with us about the terrain, potential trails the beast could use, and its recent recorded locations. Thomas also pointed out areas that could be particularly dangerous due to their ruggedness and other risks not directly related to our mission. I asked Thomas if he had noticed any suspicious individuals in the vicinity. He replied negatively, noting that access to the park had been restricted after a series of attacks but he did not rule out the possibility that someone could have entered unnoticed by the authorities. We thanked him for the information provided and continued on our way. With only a few days left until the full moon, our task during this time was to locate the suspect. It was easier to catch the werewolf while it was in human form, giving us the opportunity to capture and confirm its identity before proceeding with its neutralization. The entire first day of our search was spent in tense exploration of the terrain. We carefully looked for any traces the werewolf might have left behind. Despite our diligence, the day ended without any significant findings. As dusk fell, we decided to set up camp and spend the night in tents, ready to continue the search at dawn with renewed vigor. On the second day of our search, as we made our way through dense thickets, we stumbled upon an abandoned wooden cabin. It seemed ancient, with weather-beaten walls and a sagging roof, under which lay the history of many years. The door to the house was ajar, inviting us inside. Stepping in, we found ourselves in a room where chaos reigned. Furniture was overturned, shelves were almost empty, and torn books and personal belongings littered the floor. Traces of blood created a gruesome picture on the floor and walls, adding an element of horror to the already grim atmosphere. As we inspected the wreckage, a man approached the house, dressed in worn-out clothes that once may have been sturdy and warm, but were now worn and dirty. His face was covered in a thick beard, and there was something troubled in his eyes. The man introduced himself as Marcus, Marcus greeted us with suspicion and asked what we were doing in such a remote place. In turn, we asked him about the reasons for his presence here and whether he had noticed anything unusual lately. His answers were vague and raised more questions than answers. Everything in his behavior and the environment around indicated that he might be connected to our investigation. I glanced at Jack, then looked at John. He nodded. We surrounded him from three sides while Sophia couldn't understand what we were about to do. John stood opposite the suspect and said, Excuse me, sir, but we ask for your cooperation. Could you stay with us for a while? What? What do you want? I'm not guilty, I swear. Why do you want to detain me? Marcus replied, stepping back and stuttering. We won't harm you. Just ask you to stay with us until midnight. The man got scared and tried to run away, but we grabbed him and tied him up. Sophia was outraged by our actions and looked at us reproachfully. We simply shrugged. We had no choice. There were only six hours left until midnight, and in that time we would hardly be able to find anything. And this man was extremely suspicious. We tidied up the house and moved the man inside. He continued to struggle, but soon calmed down. We brought some firewood and lit a fire in front of the house. 
Then we grilled some meat and fed the man. At first he refused, but the smell of food hit his nose and he gulped it all down, apparently very hungry. It was 11.45 on the clock and we were ready. Earlier I had briefed everyone, especially explaining to Sophia what to do and how. We stood surrounding the man, tying him even tighter, and aimed our weapons loaded with tranquilizers at him. The man initially protested, but when we pointed the gun barrels at him, he visibly wilted. Then he started crying and murmuring some prayer. We exchanged awkward glances. Sophia looked disapprovingly at it all. But what could we do? It was always better to be safe than sorry. It was 11.55 on the clock. Suddenly someone began knocking on our door, which we had previously locked. Hey, who's inside? Open up. Visiting this park is forbidden. We heard a familiar voice. It turned out to be our acquaintance, park ranger Thomas Hale. He persistently knocked on the door, to which I responded, loudly stating that it was us and the situation was under our control, urging him to step back. The knocking stopped for a moment. Then, through the gap in the door, which turned out to be wide enough, I noticed his eye. Thomas apparently saw the scene before him and demanded explanations about what was happening. John couldn't hold back and replied for him to mind his own business and bug off. It was 11.59 on the clock. We were incredibly tense and kept our eyes on the man. He continued to sob and hum something under his breath. Midnight struck and the tension in the air reached its peak. Suddenly the lantern illuminating the room began to flicker, which scared Sophia. But nothing happened. I double-checked my watch and realized we got the wrong one. Suddenly I heard some noise in the yard. I walked to the door, opened it, and looked outside. There, with his back to us, stood our familiar ranger. His head was lowered as if he were looking for something on the ground, his shoulders trembling as if he were holding back laughter. Then he raised his head and howled. My partners also looked out and stared in shock at the scene. And then it started. The transformation. It was my first time seeing something so terrifying and disgusting. The ranger began to tremble madly and emit horrible moans of pain. His arms elongated, and before our eyes, his entire body began to be covered with fur, his clothes tearing in places, his boots splitting with a pop and flying apart in different directions, revealing huge paws with claws. The transformation ended, and the creature still stood with its back to us, breathing heavily, steam coming out of its mouth. Then it slowly turned its head towards us. Our gazes met. A horribly grotesque and frightening wolf face looked at us. I fired. The creature roared and lunged towards us. I hit it in the shoulder, but it didn't stop it. It leaped towards me and I quickly threw myself backward and closed the door. The werewolf crashed into it and tore it off its hinges, which stopped its momentum and gave us time to open fire. A barrage of bullets flew at it. It, wounded, roared and leaped into the night. We chased after it but saw that it had managed to disappear into the bushes. We looked around in bewilderment. Then I glanced at the man who had become an unwitting participant in our hunt. But he had already lost consciousness from this horrible scene. We untied him and laid him on the bed in the corner. Then we packed our things and prepared to leave. Sophia was against leaving him like that, but I was sure the werewolf wouldn't come back. And the man, waking up in the morning, would think it was just a nightmare. We left and soon found ourselves at yesterday's parking spot. We didn't pursue the werewolf as we could turn from hunters into prey. At night, with poor visibility, this creature could leap out from any bush. In the morning, we began discussing our next steps. Since the werewolf had transformed, we had three days to catch it. Then Sophia asked a question. If in three days he will transform back into a human, 
Why don't we just wait it out? We know his identity. We'll just catch him when he's human. That's unacceptable. I shook my head negatively. You saw that the park is closed. But there was a man here. How many more people could be here? It's a big risk. There could be killings or infections. That's why the government hired us to catch the monster, not the man. Everyone looked at me as the most experienced hunter, waiting for me to decide. I proposed my version, and everyone frowned, pondering what I had said. A couple of hours later, I sat and looked through binoculars, surveying the surroundings. Jack sat next to me, checking his rifle for malfunctions. Silence reigned around us, and there were no signs of the beast's presence. My gaze slid across the open clearing in front of us, where Sophia was waiting. Next to her a speaker was loudly playing animal sounds, and nearby a flag fluttered, catching every gust of wind. On the opposite side of the clearing, perched on a tree branch, was John, a former soldier ready to open fire at short range. I continued to survey the area when Jack interrupted me with a question. Don't you think this is too dangerous? He asked for the umpteenth time. Of course it's dangerous, but she volunteered to be the bait, and it makes sense since she's the worst with weapons, I replied while still looking through the binoculars. I understand all that, but I have a feeling that things won't go according to plan, Jack said worriedly. I just shrugged. My strategy was simple. Lure the predator. Earlier in the arsenal I found an audio device labeled for attracting prey. I had encountered similar methods before, but I was surprised by the presence of a specialized device for werewolves. I also found a vial of liquid labeled pheromones for werewolves. I had brought these items in advance, packing them into a backpack. However, it wasn't enough. We also needed a visual lure. Sharing this thought with my colleagues, we all pondered until Sophia suggested her candidacy. At first I was against it, but in the end I agreed. We dressed Sophia in an anti-dog suit found in the armory assuming it could protect her from possible bites. Then we found a secluded clearing surrounded by trees and well visible from our observation point on the hill. In the center of the clearing we placed columns emitting sounds intended to attract the creature, and nearby we planted a flag liberally sprayed with pheromones. Thanks to the wind, the flag fluttered actively, spreading the scent around. I glanced at my watch. It was six. Evening was approaching, which meant it would soon be getting dark. I looked through the binoculars, but the predator was still not in sight. Jack continued the conversation. Why did you agree to this mission? He asked. Well, I pondered, probably primarily out of hunting interest. For me, it was a new challenge. And what about you? Why did you agree? It's simple for the money. Jack replied and looked sadly at the forest. After what I went through at work, I would never have agreed to this proposal in my life. But my daughter got seriously ill, and I need money for her treatment. I understand. I think success awaits us. And everything will be fine with your daughter, I said. I hope so, Jack replied sadly. Suddenly I caught movement with my eye. Something was descending from the mountain and running towards Sophia. Could it be our client? I took a closer look, and shivers ran down my spine. We lured the wrong one. Among the bushes and trees, a large hairy figure was running. It was a bear. I urgently shouted into the radio. Sophia, you need to leave immediately. A bear is approaching you. Do you hear me? What? Yes. But in this suit, I won't be able to run far. But I'll try. She panicked and replied. Jack, a former ranger, knew how to distract the bear. He ran towards Sophia. Meanwhile, I continued to survey the surroundings, and suddenly I spotted another movement. Upon closer inspection, 
I realized it was the werewolf this time. It was running directly towards the bear. I immediately reacted and shouted into the radio. Alert! A werewolf is also approaching us, be ready. Jack, don't get closer to Sophia, take your position. John, be ready to open fire. Sophia, follow the previously prepared plan. I finished the message and grabbed my rifle. It was a legendary .338 Lapua Magnum, capable of hitting targets over a mile away with a large caliber. I lay down, took aim, and looked through the scope. Then I turned on the radio and continued to coordinate the team. Bear at two o'clock, we'll be here in about a minute. Werewolf at 10 o'clock. Looks like they're in for a pleasant meeting. Soon, the bear emerged onto the clearing, roaring as it charged towards Sophia. She continued to stand her ground, while the bear closed the distance. Suddenly, from another part of the clearing, the werewolf leaped out. It was incredibly fast, but surprisingly, it wasn't running towards Sophia, but towards the bear. The bear noticed it, abruptly stopped, and ran towards the werewolf. There was a collision, and the bear tumbled backward. I was amazed. This monster was incredibly strong if it could fend off a bear. Then a fight ensued. The werewolf sank its teeth into the bear's neck, tearing at it. The bear roared in pain, trying to shake off the werewolf. However, the werewolf held on firmly, and soon the bear fell lifeless, its head dangling on a piece of skin. The werewolf, still not satisfied, continued to feed on its blood. Then it stood up, lifted its head in ecstasy, and howled. A chill ran down our spines. After that, it turned towards Sophia. I roughly estimated the werewolf's strength and realized that her flimsy costume wouldn't protect her. I shouted into the radio to open fire. Shots rang out. Some bullets hit their target, causing the werewolf to howl in pain. I took a shot and hit its leg, sending it sprawling to the side. I reloaded my rifle, but at that moment, the creature leaped up and lunged towards the trees. Jack was sitting there, having climbed a tree earlier, firing at the werewolf. Though wounded, the creature dodged actively, zigzagging as it ran. Then it jumped high, very high. I aimed and fired. I hit it, but the creature still managed to reach Jack and knock him off the tree. I didn't shoot because there was a chance I might hit Jack. I was ready to run, but then I saw Sophia running to help. Awkwardly shuffling in her costume, she headed towards Jack with her secret weapon. I calmed down and took my position again. Just as the werewolf was about to leap at Jack, who was unconscious on the ground, Sophia managed to reach him and throw a grenade. It exploded, and silver smoke engulfed the area. The werewolf became disoriented and began clawing at its face as if sneezing. It was my chance. I aimed at the creature and fired once, then again. Finally, the werewolf fell and stopped moving. I grabbed another rifle and ran. Sophia was already administering first aid to Jack, who had regained consciousness and was looking around bewilderedly. John ran to them at the same time I did. We approached the werewolf's body which lay motionless. It was still breathing. The bullets didn't have a strong armor-piercing effect but they contained tranquilizers that were finally taking effect. John decided to flip the body over, and suddenly the werewolf opened its eyes and swatted at John with its hand. Luckily, he reacted in time, being a former soldier, so the blow wasn't fatal. I opened fire with the rifle. The creature convulsed and froze. I ran to John, but he had already gotten up. I breathed a sigh of relief. I pulled a syringe from my bag and filled it with an additional dose of tranquilizer. Then I injected it into the werewolf. That should do it. Then I checked on my companions. Jack had a broken arm but was otherwise okay. We exchanged relieved glances. The job was done, but shock and horror still lingered on our faces. I contacted Alex via radio and soon people arrived to transport the werewolf's body. 
we received first aid as well. Back at base, we finally got a chance to rest. Lying on the bed, I reflected on the events that had just unfolded. The mission was indeed extremely risky. Suddenly, my phone pinged with a notification. The message read, $500,000 has been deposited into your account. I was surprised by how quickly the agency processed the payment. My surprise quickly turned to joy, but not for my own gain. I was happy for Jack. Now he could afford his daughter's treatment. A smile spread across my face, but then another message came in. It was from Alex. He urgently summoned us all to the living room. I instantly jumped off the bed and hurried there. In the living room, Sophia was already present and Alex was visibly agitated, pacing back and forth. It didn't take long for the rest of us to join. Alex looked at us and with evident regret in his voice began to speak. I'm sorry to interrupt your well-deserved rest, but we need to urgently go to a certain place. It will be your next mission. We exchanged dismayed looks but didn't refuse the task, except for Jack, who stayed at the base due to his injury. Leaving the building, we got into the car and drove for a couple of hours until we reached the forest. Turning off the main road, we continued along a newly cut trail, with freshly felled trees still lying around. After about half an hour, we arrived at our destination, where towering pines and dense undergrowth greeted us. The area was fenced off, with an open metal hatch at its center. Alex was the first to climb down, and we followed suit. Descending, we soon saw light and found ourselves in the corridor of an underground structure. There were many people here, engaged in lively conversations and discussions. Alex led us further down the corridor. It wasn't long before we stopped in front of a door guarded by two security personnel. Showing his pass, Alex secured our entry. Inside, we were greeted by a spacious, well-lit laboratory. At its center stood a huge capsule, surrounded by a group of scientists in white lab coats. Asking the scientists to clear the space, Alex approached the capsule. Once the scientists dispersed, we saw a sight that shocked us. In the capsule, filled with green liquid, floated a huge, grotesque wolf's head. Its gaze seemed so realistic that it felt like it could come to life any moment and pounce on us. We stood there, unable to tear our eyes away from this monster. Alex, approaching us, began to speak with noticeable concern in his voice. Are you surprised? I was shocked too when I saw this creature. So we need to unravel its origin. And that will be your next task. We didn't know what to say. Please subscribe to the channel so we can be motivated to do more interesting stories. Thanks for listening.